welcome everyone. Um, my name is Daniel Niles. I'm an associate professor of geography at the Research Institute for Humanity and Nature. And I welcome you uh, to the fifth and final day of our symposium this year, The Arts of Living with Nature. Um, it's been really a fascinating symposium so far, and we have one more uh, last day to go. But today is not the end, uh, is not the conclusion, but rather, as we have stated in the program, uh, a renewal, uh, a, a new beginning. So today we take some of the ideas which we have been um, discussing over the past days and renew them, uh, come to fresh beginnings. We come to ways of thinking and seeing and feeling, learning and doing that do not separate us from the nature which is all around us and the nature which is in us, but instead connects it to us in a much more profound way. Um, today we have two sessions, an academic session uh, which we are bringing and then a public session uh, which will follow almost immediately after this uh, session ends. And I want to remind you again that you are welcome um, to participate by raising your hand for questions um, and asking uh, in the question and answer at the bottom of your screen um, questions directly of any speaker. We will try to uh, bring those into the discussion. And today we have uh, four uh, speakers, um, four presentations rather than three. And so a little bit less time for me in this introduction. And so I would like to turn um, just now uh, to our first speaker. Each speaker will ask to speak for about 20 minutes and we'll have just a minute or two for a quick question following each presentation and then open discussion all together um, at the end. So uh, welcome again. And with that, I'd like to invite our first speaker who is Eko Honda. Uh, Eko is based in the University of Oxford in the UK. And so I um, use the English uh, uh, or the Western um, uh, uh, address um, rather than uh, Honda Eko. But um, Eko is an old uh, friend of our institute. She is at Oxford, as I say, she is also the Landhouse Fellow at the Rachel, Rachel Carson Center for the Environment and Society. And she is working on the work um, uh, and the life of Minakata Kumagusu, a fascinating uh, scientist um, from over 100 years ago here in Japan. Her paper is titled Minakata Kumagusu and the Emergence of Queer Nature, the Civilization Theory, Buddhist Science and Microbes, 1887 to 1892. So Eko, welcome, and please, if you would begin. Thank you very much for the generous introduction, Daniel. And it's been a, a great pleasure to be participating in this wonderfully stimulating symposium uh, with some familiar uh, faces as well. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Let's start my slide. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks again for having me at this uh, very exciting symposium. Um, as part of my contribution, uh, I would like to open one of the Japanese historical trajectories to some of the key ideas that have been discussed over the past few days. And these include uh, the epistemology of nature, culture, entanglement in science. How, how what we nowadays regard as artistic and humanistic knowledge may illuminate the ways in which, uh, the ways to think of the beating track and the uh, unintended consequences of civilizational progress led by certain scientific and technological innovations. These including uh, anthropogenic disasters we talked about, and uh, some of the speakers talked about. And so as much as these are contemporary concerns, some people also uh, grappled with the similar questions more than 100 years ago in modern Japan. Now, the period of modern Japan is commonly known as the era of modernization through westernization. The Meiji government persecuted Buddhism from its outset and called other Asia derived epistemologies, such as Confucianism, foolish that should be discarded into the past. 
they instead adopted dichotomizing hierarchical epistemology of the Western science and the social Darwinian idea of civilizational progress that asserted the survival of the fittest. This is this happened especially during the um, 1880s, um, during the period when the government established its own imperial diet and so on. And so today I will be focusing on a case study of the independent naturalist polymath Minakate Kumagusu, as Daniel kindly introduced already, who regarded these state-led ideas to be uncivilized. And he turned to Buddhism and the microbe slime mold you can see here on this uh, slide, and to, in order to reconsider the very nature of what it truly meant to be civilized. And in Japan, Kumagusu has been canonized as a pioneer of ecological thinking and the intellectual giant, making enormous contributions to both science and the humanities while forging intellectual bonds with various historical figures, such as the Chinese evolutionary Sun Yat-sen and the founder of Japanese folklore studies, Yanagida Kunio. Yet underlying logic, behind his seemingly discursive transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary thoughts and actions remained unclear. And I argue what interconnected all of these was what I conceptualize as queer nature. Queer nature resembled slime mold in its ontological and experiential qualities. And the historically diverse notion of the English term queer captured all of these characteristics. And ontologically, the elusive biology of slime mold appeared to defy the biological dichotomies of male and female, plant and animal, and even life and death. And experientially, this microbe never ceased to fascinate him. They inspired him to inquire further and extend his effective desire for intimacy with one another. So why is the discussion of nature important in consideration of civilization theory? Civilization theory in this period depended on how one understood the evolutionary nature of society comparable to the nature of the universe discovered by modern science, such as gravity. What can be understood as a universal nature provided the indisputable basis of truth? Therefore, the argumentation of what it truly meant to be civilized stood on the knowledge of nature. This is the same kind of logic people like Fukuzawa Yukichi uh, used to develop his civilization theory. And importantly, what knowledge mattered and why depended on the ideas of civilization theory. Kamegusu turned to the foolish knowledge of the Asian past as what muttered in this discourse when he arrived in the US at the age of two, tw age 20. There and then the Meiji state's vision of civilizational progress he was taught in Japan slipped down to the idea of retrogression in a similar manner to what Shokonishi termed as history slide or lekishi no jisubeli in Japanese. It's least because the historical ground for the West inspired civilization theory, namely modern science and evolutionary theory, seemed relatively young compared to, for example, Buddhism, of course. What, and what is worse, the marker of so called civil, civilized society in the US presented itself with an alarming degree of racial conflict and discrimination, which he experienced himself at first hand. This experience coincided with the death of his male lover, Hayama Shigetaro, on the left you can see, um, he left behind in Japan. Shigetaro's ill health did not let him survive as a fittest in the social Darwinian progress. So Kamagasu rectified the history by turning to Shingon Buddhism, a branch of Mahayana Buddhism that affirmed the non-binary ontology and epistemology evoked by his memory of intimacy with the no longer physically obtainable lover and his attraction toward the curious existence of microbes. 
The microbe he observed under the microscope reminded him of the intimacy he shared with Shigetaro, for their appearance strangely resembled the sexual, human sexual organ, as you can see in this picture here. This is a drawing by him. In observation of this microbe, Kumagusa adopted the epistemology of Mahayana Buddhism, where the subject of observa observation emerged in reflection of the observer's kokoro or mind heart. And this is how he classified the realms of his own kokoro on the left and the world to which the microbes belonged on the right. As a result, I argue, that he discerned the nature, the basis of truth, for what it truly meant to be civilized as queer nature. A semi-fictional autobiographical novel he wrote for his friend <clears throat> Watanabe Ryusei in 1889 demonstrate the emotional and intellectual grounds behind his simultaneous engagement with Buddhism and microbes. So here I will briefly explain and unpack this uh, piece of writing rather than reading it out. Um, so he portrayed himself as a fictional Buddhist monk, Jintaku, and Kamagusu merged his persona as a monk with his desire for intimacy with his closest brother, Shigetaro, by noting that the monk himself belonged to Shigetaro's hometown, Hidaka, in Wakayama region. This monk, this monk became aware of his life pursuit. Upon reading the autobiographical novella text of Kukai, the founder of Shingon Buddhism, Jintaku had to rescue the society from the intellectual chaos as Minakata Kumagusu in the human world, just like Kukai. The society was in an epistemological turmoil. People could not discern what it actually meant to become civilized in the light of the Buddhist truth. Social Darwinism, championed by the philosopher Herbert Spencer, normalized the Christian derived epistemology which conceptualized the world in dichotomies um, as, an, uh, as a normative idea. Japanese Buddhism lost its epistemology to this social Darwinian norm. Kumagusu exam examined the nature, the basis truths for civilization theory in microbes he collected out in the field and forest, outside institutional education. He did so in the light of Buddhist epistemology and where the matter and mind heart or kokoro appeared in symbiosis. He then went on to imagine a different kind of civilization by cr comparing cross-mixing of human race to microbial osmosis shortly before he left Cuba in search of rare slime mold. He, however, never wrote a cohesive thesis on his own civilization theory. But as I analyzed the wide range of primary historical sources while asserting queer nature as his basis of truth, revealed some ideas he interwove in, in between his diary, letters, research notebooks, and the autobiographical novels and comedies he wrote. Firstly, Civilizing subjectivity in his theory simultaneously embraced independence and collectivity through cooperation beyond imposed epistemological divides among race, sex, and nationalities. Secondly, he indicated that people civilize through self knowledge, independent of unquestioning reliance on state provided knowledge. And thirdly, his self knowledge elucidated affective desire for each other inviting collectivity and bounded by the binary sex, life, death, and the norm normative racial taxonomy imposed on human beings. Kumagusu's civilization, civilization theory thus carried a utopian yearning to liberate himself and others from epistemological constraints of racial and sexual bias and hierarchical social conditions amid emotional and intellectual struggle. To conclude this presentation, I would like to note that Kumagusu went on to develop his idea of ideas on the relationship between Buddhism, science, and civilization theory later in his life. And in doing so, he complained that the problem 
with modern, modern Western science is that it started with the examination of the universe, something that's really far away out from the earth. Instead of looking up to the sky, one had to examine the closest sources of knowledge. In other words, your own kokoro, a microbe by staying on earth. Thank you. Great. Eiko, thank you very much for this presentation. It's really interesting. Um, the, 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 the task to liberate oneself from epistemological bias and the method that Kumalusu uh, 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 used, which was very much through the self. That's a, a, a fascinating and um, an affirming uh, way of going about the problem um, of addressing that. And I see we have a, a little bit of time left. So, um, uh, and uh, uh, Masahiro has a question. So Masahiro, can you hear me? If you can ask your question. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, Eiko-san. It is very fascinating. And I, I think it's, uh, it is the first attempt that the Kumagus's uh, uh, fascin fascination to the slime world in terms of his youth in USA. So it is it's open new uh, dimension of the Kumagus study in not only in Japan in, in the world wide. I think <laughs> so. I, I, I would like to ask uh, or to confirm your term, terminology queer nature. Uh, you uh, mentioned, uh, you showed the slide in the Ben diagram, two diagram, uh, and in the middle of the time, Kokoro, uh, mind, and mono thing, uh, there are uh, queer nature you uh, d defined. But I think in that that uh, diagram, Kumagus uh, used the mon uh, Koto or the Mata, so, uh, could you explain that uh, Venn diagram uh, shortly uh, more in detail? Yes, of course. Thank you very much, Sarah. So it's lovely to see you again. And uh, uh, so the um, Minakade Kumagusu's uh, studies of kotonogaku, uh, the or study of uh, things in, in English, I would say, um, it emerged after the period of um, his stay in the US. Uh, so it emerged in exchange, in another exchange between himself and Togi Horyu, who is another long, long, lifelong uh, 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 friend of his. And uh, so um, I, I, in my monograph that I'm working on, uh, I, I argue that the, uh, his ideas for the kotonogaku actually was already in development in his natural science in microbiology already in the period of um, stay, his stay in America. So there's a closer relationship, but it sort of, in my work, it belongs to another different chapter, different historical period and time and space. Uh, thank you. And, and, and how do the queer and koto rate each other? Could you explain? <laughs> you could, mm, of course, yes. Uh, so uh, koto no gaku, um, the, the uh, so, uh, so uh, just for, for, for audience who, who, don't, who are not familiar with Minakata Kumagusu and his theory of Kotonogaku, it, it's an idea, it's a phenomenology, it's a type of phenomenological theory that uh, how, how the world emerged. He argued that he emerged, uh, um, he argued that it emerged at the intersection of uh, Mata and Kokoro as in, in, in the uh, mind and heart. Uh, and the intersection is what he understood as things. And uh, this discussion very much emerged out of uh, question of metaphysics, so the nature of reality. So, and, uh, uh, so, and that is um, specific to, yeah, so the, the, the discussion of the nature of reality, whereas the, uh, the, the the, conversation, the, the discourse I, I focus in this presentation specifically ties into what his basis for truth was in relation to uh, civilization theory that he was trying to uh, generate uh, or arrive at. Um, so uh, that's the sort of 
distinctive difference, I guess, like it's more specific. And then I would argue that uh, it, he went on to expand on uh, a, a much wider uh, uh, question of metaphysics. And uh, which is, of course, uh, also the question of the nature of the universe and nature of reality is to do with the nature of the universe as well. So, uh, so that's the difference, I would say. Oh, thank you very much. Great. Um, Eko, I wonder, we have just another minute as well. So I wonder if you would, because Kumaguso is such an interesting character, he uh, published widely in the, in the leading scientific journals of the time. As I know, he published a hundred articles or so in science, uh, as, as at least that's what I remember reading. Um, but he also, as you were mentioning, wrote um, novels and poetry. And you, having r read through his materials, I wonder about the 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 experience of reading those two uh, forms. Are they completely different, or do the ideas in one uh, um, a media cross over into others? Um, so yes, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so um, uh, you're right that uh, Kumagusu um, published so much in, in, in the field of science as well that, that uh, he, he published, I think, one article in science and 51 articles in the journal Nature and uh, over, I can't remember, 200 or something. Uh, and, but th this period I, 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 I presented today is a period before he became a polymath and he became a pro before he became a prolific author. So there's distinctive I would say there's a distinctive difference between the kind of writing he presented to the public and the kind of writing that he wrote either in private or just his friends in mind. So the, uh, the autographical uh, novel that I shared uh, in the presentation, uh, he wrote it in the handwritten newspaper he created just to be circulated among his group of friends uh, in the US, in Japanese friends actually, in the US, and he specifically said that this is not to be circulated anywhere outside, and so it was something of a very private affair. And what I love about these novels is that it, it, it's as much as he handles very sad um, uh, earnest topics. He 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 almost always like uh, interweaves uh, this element of comedy, and uh, I'm also it, that's another topic I would love to explore in the future. That you know uh, the usage of comedy and laughter uh, as a way to as a way to. Uh, uh, communicate something so dead serious and uh, and he in fact actually said in one of the pieces that uh, oh I pretend to be fooling around but uh, it, it is precisely to get you you know that's the most effective way to sort of you know get into people's minds because people like I, I assume that people are off guard when, when you're watching comedy and so so in that sense like I, I wonder um, if there's a relationship to this discussion of the usage of the arts and uh, not only comedy but the uh, style particular style of writing and the novel that much of it actually he adopted uh, works uh, type of works from Tokugawa period and uh, 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 the um, potency of these mediums to actually uh, go off the off the unbeaten track, and uh, yes, and, and it also, of course, relates to the the idea of narrative and narrative making and the usage of narrative that uh, that came up uh, yesterday at one of the panels, I think. Great. Okay, Eko, thank you very much for your presentation. It's a really interesting subject, and I'm so glad you were able to join us today. So um, with that, I would like to turn to our next uh, presentation and ask uh, uh, Ono Tadashi um, to join us. Uh, Ono-san, can you hear me now? Hi, I can hear Great. So... Uh, uh, Ono-san is a photographer teaching at the, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, it feels, uh, it would be wrong of me to try to speak uh, French. So I, I, in English, I think we would say the, the, the high, high or the superior school of uh, photography in France. He has been working since 2011, especially on the transformation of the landscape in the Tohoku uh, region of Japan following 
uh, the great disaster and tsunami there uh, some years ago. And um, also on the representation of public space in uh, Gezi Park, Istanbul. Um, and uh, we're very pleased to have him here today with us. Onusan, please, welcome. Hi, I'm どうですか皆さんあの画像が見えます。Hello uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Tadashi Ono. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, transdisciplinary symposium. Today I would like to uh, talk about art, uh, especially in nature, especially uh, plant, which symbolizes nature and how it is being expressed by the media of photography in the field of art. Although the numbers, uh, number of works is limited, I would like to show you uh, some slides. In the abstract, I try to cover uh, many things, but uh, uh, since uh, time is limited, I would like to omit the theme, uh, the first theme about uh, painting. Photography is a, a medium that symbolizes modern European visual perception. And I believe that uh, through the years, the role of camera has been to comprehensively uh, observe, depict, and record the world's phenomena. Today, we are at a major turning point in our relationship with the natural environment. We also need to rethink the use of visual media, such as photography and video. By the way, the photo of a tree on the cover of this presentation, uh, you are looking at it uh, in an inverted uh, direction. In fact, this is the image of the world projected through the lens, which we call real uh, for the last 500 years. The negative image on the right is the image that is created when the projected image reacts with the photosensitive material. This is a, a sunspot uh, painted by the Italian astronomer uh, Galileo Galilei uh, in the early 17th century. Galileo observed celestial ob objects through the telescope he built himself using lenses imported from Holland. Uh, the slide is still in the first uh, page, so, so if uh, Ono-san can say the next slide, uh, we will be controlling the slides. So we will be uh, sharing the slides on our side. So this uh, drawing of Galileo is probably the earliest image of an optical machine. In Western language, the word photography means... Just a minute, please. This is the second uh, slide. So if you could tell us to uh, change the slides. So in the Western language, the word uh, photography means uh, iconograph, iconography drawn with light. But in the 19th century, it was called uh, heliography or iconography uh, drawn by the sun. Without the light of the sun, photography uh, would not be possible. A camera obscura uh, is a device that allows the sun's ray to pass uh, through a small hole or lens to obtain an image. It means dark room. The 16th century drawing is one of the earliest depiction of the camera obscura. The painting depicts the observation of the solar eclipse. Ibis uh, is a symbol of wisdom. Drawing a weeds by German Renaissance artist uh, Albrecht Durell. It is not known uh, whether Durell uh, used the help of an optical machine or not, considering the year of production, uh, 1503. However, the photographic realism of his eyes, which seems to have become lenses as they are, and the sensitivity 
with which they focus on small ordinary roadside ecosystem is simply astonishing. If you look closely, you can see that he has uh, painted about eight different kinds of plants, and even the roots and soil have been carefully drawn. On the other hand, when we look at the world of Japanese painting, decorative or stylized paintings are the mainstream. However, uh, Jakuchu Ito's uh, Chihen Gunchuzu uh, is a unique uh, work. The detailed depiction of hidden insects is wonderful. I think the richness of Japan's unique waterside ecosystem is beautifully depicted. This is the view of an Italian garden painted in about the same year as Jakchu's Chihen uh, Gunchuzu uh, insects by the pond. Uh, it was painted by French painter Hubert Robert. The subject of this work is a garden, but what is interesting is that it is not a neatly managed garden, which was the mainstream at that time, but rather depicts the power of nature, which is beyond human control. Trees, dense and swaying in the wind are depicted along the signs of a storm. Robert uh, has been painting ruins and remains for a long time, so it is clear that the presence of human beings in the undulation of nature and time is a key element of his work. Perhaps the artist is aware of the smallness of the space. Gustave Le Gray, he's a photographer. After the uh, invention of photography, uh, many painters became photographers, and Gustave Le Gray of France was one of them. The main theme was how to go out into nature like an impressionist, a painter, and paint a, wor a world filled with uh, sunlight. I think it was a very important theme for him. And uh, this is the forest of Fontainebleau, uh, where this photo was taken, was the best place uh, for artists in Paris to come in, come into contact with uh, pure nature. It is about five hours uh, away from Paris. This is a Gustave Le Gray uh, tree study. The photo shows an ordinary bush at the base of a tree. However, when the image is backlit, the light reflects off the leaves and grass, flooding the space with light. How to express this space is the subject of this work. A French uh, explorer and a photographer, Désir Charnay, uh, a giant uh, baobab tree in Madagascar, photographed by uh, this French explorer and photographer, Dizel Chermay, is what you are seeing at. Uh, the photo was uh, taken from the front straight on as an exotic monument. And the base of the tree, at the base of the tree, a figure is photographed uh, as an indicator uh, to tell you how big the tree is. In the late 19th uh, century, the business of collecting such photographs and selling them as photo albums began. Wealthy Europeans uh, would look at these uh, photo albums in the salon of their homes and travel around the world. They could travel virtually and enjoy natural landscapes. I think we can say that this was the beginning of an era in which visual information replaced actual experience. This is a uh, French photographer, Eugene Aget, uh, trees in the St. Cloud Park. In the 20th century, the gaze on nature was completely separated from the tradition of painting. Aje uh, took uh, comprehensive uh, photographs of parks uh, in and around Paris. In this photograph, the powerful vitality of the trees is recorded, and at the same time, the light and shadow, uh, the trunk and the branches, are organic, and uh, it is also an experiment in the intricate uh, forms created by the interplay of lines. It also corresponds to the art, uh, art movement, such as uh, cubism and surrealism, that were emerging at that time.
German sculptor Karl Blosvet uh, carefully focuses on the details of the plants uh, in close-up. The work is a typology of natural forms. Gross felt uh, his vast collection of details has helped him to understand the human created forms and design. He tried to prove that all of design can find its origin in the forms of nature. This is a worksheet uh, with test prints of uh, Blosfeld. It is a, a collection of fractal forms. This is grass by Alfred uh, Stiglitz. Stiglitz uh, was one of the founders of modern American photography. This work is an attempt to use photography to create a work that uh, responds to abstract painting, which was the cutting edge of expression at that time. Kardensky uh, it was uh, introduced to uh, America by uh, uh, Stiglitz. The lines of the grass family uh, cover the entire screen in, in an all over uh, pattern. There is no story, no drama, only details of the plants. It is a novel work uh, which realism and abstraction coexist. Lee Friedlander is an American a photographer. Uh, this is uh, one of the series called Cherry Blossoms that uh, he took in Japan. This is an interesting and provocative work that explores the symbol or myth or cherry blossoms in Japan, the aesthetics in Japan. I think it is an attempt to challenge and deconstruct this aesthetic. This is also uh, Lee Friedlander. The colors of the flowers are ignored and only black and white photographs are used to show the Japanese spring. The images are not the landscape in the brain, but faithful to the eyes of the lens, depicting nature without hierarchy. Robert Adams. Robert Adams is one of the most important contemporary American landscape photographer and a conservationist. This work is from Adams' classic uh, Los Angeles Spring series. This series documents the environmental destruction and pollution of uh, the Los Angeles suburbs during the 1970s and 1980s. What is uh, particularly uh, memorable in the Los Angeles Spring is the re, uh, recurring appearance of damaged and dying tree. It is a sad and beautiful metaphor for nature uh, exploited by humans. Uh, Toshio Shibata, a Japanese photographer, from the 1980s to the present, he has been pho uh, photographing the relationship between various man-made structures built in the mountains of Japan and the natural landscape. He continues to photograph uh, from his unique perspective. The structures created by Japan's excessive civil engineering uh, technology seem like anonymous sculptures. This work has a mysterious uh, charm. Uh, in recent uh, works of Shibata, the dialogue between nature and agriculture, as well as concrete and steel structures, is the key to the creation of his new work. Simone Niewig is a German photographer. She has been working for 30 years in the field of vegetable gardening and small-scale agriculture. And she has been uh, photographing various forms created by such people. What is interesting about uh, Niewig's work is that she views and photographs the forms that are unconsciously expressed as a result of the basic relationship with nature, such as growing vegetables, as, as if they were works of art. 
and then brings them inside a museum as works of art. This shed and the surrounding plants are all treated as if they were installation pieces. At the same time, I think it is possible to see it as an homage or homage to bricolage. Johan Rempelt is a German photographer and a biologist. The black and white photographic prints he exhibits look amer amateurish and unreliable and very weak. I feel that this is connected to the vulnerability that has been denied by humans holding cameras with the power of seeing. However, because of this vulnerability, Rempelt seems to have succeeded in sharing his senses on the same level with animals and plants and their world. It is, this is also uh, Rempelt's uh, work entitled Wind. It is difficult to draw any kind of conclusion from the works we have seen so far. But when uh, considering how we see nature and how we view nature, there are certainly differences between the West and the East. But at the same time, the media, uh, in case of photographic equipment, uh, devices using lenses are also uh, important because taking photograph always means that our consciousness is betrayed by the lens, by the eye of the machine. In other words, standing in front of the subject to be photographed is the photographer's uh, will, but it is also dependent upon climate and encounters and other coincidence. After pressing the shutter, the result is dependent upon the light, the photosensitive materials and chemical reactions, and in other words, uh, to nature. Such characteristics of photography uh, make it an old fashioned media. Uh, however, it is still, uh, attracts young people. Lastly, I would like to uh, introduce uh, to you some of, some of my uh, photographs. This is uh, the field work uh, from periphery. This is a series that attempts to capture the landscape of uh, Paris or Parisian uh, suburbs uh, through architecture, tree and plants uh, in the wasteland. Paris uh, is a city that symbolizes moder modernity or uh, modern uh, age, as Benjamin said, the capital of the 19th century. In fact, more people live in the periphery or the suburbs anonymous suburbs than in the center of the city as a museum city. And it is in the suburbs that France uh, problems of modernity such as uh, colonialism and uh, immigration are concentrated. And I myself am a resident of the suburbs. This awareness of the suburbs and what Jill Clements said Teal paysage equaling a uh, third landscape are overlapped. So, like Steve Gritz's uh, photograph, the plants are in the photograph, and uh, we are having a dialogue. And I am having a dialogue as I take these photographs. Another series that I would like to uh, introduce is uh, entitled Coastal Motifs. I was invited to a symposium, uh, Does Nature Think, uh, in UNESCO. Um, I talked uh, quite a bit, so maybe uh, some of you remember that. Uh, well, this is exactly what happened 11 years ago today, the Great East Japan Earthquakes. Uh, since around 2015, when the Great East uh, Japan Earthquake uh, occurred, 
large scale, large scale construction of sea wells has been uh, continuing in the coastal area of Tohoku. And this is a series of photographs of landscapes being altered by this process, visiting the bays uh, one by one, as if on a pilgrimage. At the same time, they are photographs of an impossible journey, daring to see the sea obscured by a wall and attempting to capture what cannot be captured. Through this kind of photographic work, I try to consider the turning point in the history of Japan as a maritime nation that finally has rejected the sea and has chosen not to see it and the turning point uh, in its civilization. So these are the various types of dikes and seawalls. And I think this is one of the most violent ones. It is an archaeology of seawalls. This is after the tsunami of 1933 and after the Chidi uh, tsunami. And uh, also, uh, this is something that was uh, constructed after the uh, Great uh, East Japan earthquake. So, like a curtain, the sea is being uh, hindered or is being obscured uh, by the sea walls. So, looking at the sea walls, I have gone uh, through this journey, and uh, this is a very interesting uh, shape of uh, rock uh, close to Kamaishi. I was able to see uh, a god of water being enshrined in Fukush north of uh, Fukushima prefecture. Uh, this is a uh, wasteland uh, that was uh, created because of tsunami. And this uh, lily uh, is Lydium formosanium. It is a uh, lily originated in Taiwan. It is a lily, but uh, it can expand and grow all over. So uh, in this wasteland of the affected uh, uh, Fukushima prefecture, uh, many of these uh, lilies uh, were uh, blooming and it was very uh, impressive. So in 2023, I, I hope to publish uh, a photograph, a book of uh, uh, Miyagi Fukushima uh, to uh, see how the environment has been changing. So thank you for your attention. That is all. Ono-san, thank you very much for your presentation and for the, really for this amazing survey of the landscape photography of the West and also the introduction to your own work. I wish we had some more time to look at your own photographs. They are uh, very interesting, but I, I think that we will have a chance to come back uh, to you in the time of the general discussion. So if you will allow me, then I would just like to move along to uh, the next presentation at this moment. And that will be from Johan Moreau. Johan, are you there? I'm here. Are you are there, great. <laughs> uh, welcome. Uh, Johan is uh, a freelance anthropologist, which I think is what we all are in some way, uh, but also uh, I think uh, originally uh, trained in physics and, uh, and also um, uh, working for a long time or ex involved for a long time in the theater and has uh, worked also as a professional playwright. He is the author of Living in the Fluidity, an ethnographer on the stilts, in the Brazilian Amazon River and other works. Uh, he joins us uh, today from Izu Peninsula in Japan with his presentation, Readable Worlds, Practice-Based Mythology in Craft and Graft. So Johan, please. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and thank you also, Frederic and, uh, and uh, Abe Kenichi-sensei for, for this symposium. Um, I especially enjoyed the discussion between uh, Rissenberg uh, and uh, Timin Gold. 
and uh, also the, the opening with uh, Professor Sako and uh, Yamagiwa. So I, I moved a little my, my speech in the, in the directions they, they show. Um, the, the subject of my uh, speech today is based on two papers that I recently published in, a, in, a, in this review, Technique and Culture. And um, the two papers are entitled, the first one is entitled uh, Waza, a craft way for, I will, I will say, foodo, food, foodoing, that is um, making milieus. And the second one is uh, entitled Riding on the Worm, with, uh, with sounds like Riding on the Storm, on, on the storm uh, for, to make some music in it. And uh, I published that, that, uh, that one with uh, Oyada Mali Masumi. And um, I will not discuss uh, the, the waza and uh, the natural farming on the large scale. So I will not uh, treat the Anthropocene level, but uh, much more at the scale of human bodies and uh, of gardening, small, small scale gardening. Um, first, the, the waza was uh, really in, uh, interesting for me to work on. And uh, I, by chance, a man ca came in my cafe and this man, Kaneko Kanae Sensei, is uh, a carpenter, but not a, uh, it's, a famous carpenter. He, he worked for, he, he breed the Asakusa Sensoji uh, shrine in Tokyo. And also he was chosen to breed the funeral building of uh, Emperor, Emperor Hirohito in 1989. So uh, when he, I, I discovered that, so um, I said to, to his, I sit to his table, and uh, asked him about Waza. And uh, he told me that he learned, uh, so it was a notion he knew. And he, he told me that he learned uh, how to breed uh, houses with his father for 20 years. His father never told him how, what was good or what was bad. So he had to, to make himself, by himself, his own judgment. So, and, uh, so I asked him, how did you knew? How did you know what is good and what is bad? He said, what is good is readable. We can tell a story to ourselves when we look at it or when we touch it. We can, we can, we can figure the, the trees when, and, and even the forest where the, 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 the wood come from. And we can, we can imagine uh, and, and dream about that. And when objects or architectures uh, raises such kinds of things, there is waza in it. And also people have, that have these competencies. And one day he observed a man wor working on a piece of, of, of wood. And uh, so he, he said, this, this man get the waza, waza no aruhito in Japanese. And so he, he paid a, a big attention to his hands, but finally it was not in the, in the hands, it was in the leg, in the, in the standing leg. And, and he catch it, he catch that way. He told me that. So, and, uh, and then I, uh, he, he told me, waza no aru hito ningen ga chigao. That is quite difficult to, not difficult to translate, but, but to, to, to move to that, uh, to, to, the, to that meaning. It means les gens, the, the men who get, who get the waza are different from, from, <laughs> from humans, from Ningen. They are not humans in a way. So they are a kind of different species in France and also in English, but it's also rare in English. We, we have the, the, the word Jean, gent, 
a gent, it means uh, a, like a species, but we, also it can, there is kind of gent in the way of working. Uh, so the, the way the way of uh, working like this, and you you can have been kangaroos or or even leaves of some trees, and, and it will belong to that gent of moving like this. And um, there are, I think, of, of different kind of gent, different kind of species. And um, so the waza, in short, is a way, I think, I would tell it, put it like this, is a way of nestling or it is a kind of dramaturgy, dramaturgy nested in the matter, in the materials, in the gestures, and also in the way of doing. So it is, it is a, something that catch your attention. When there is waza, it's intriguing, and you look at it, and there is a word inside. There is something to describe, to tell about. And um, and that was that was what I learned with uh, Kaneko Sensei, and uh, also um, Zeami, with the famous Fushikaden, um, was talking about Waza, and he said Waza is a, is a, because it uh, it uh, bring attention to you. It's it's fundamental for act, actor and actress to get the waza because at the moment, at that moment, people look at you when you get it, when you, your movement get waza. And uh, they me push also with the waza, another Japanese term that is kokoro, that uh, Eiko Honda sensei talk about. The kokoro, it's a kind of, so the, the waza in the Zeami perspectives, it's, it's kind of queer, it's a kind of queer nature. It's, it's a mix of, of uh, kokoro and techniques and skills and waza and something that concerns matter. And, um, and uh, to put it also in, a, in, in another way, it's a kind of technical syntonization and sensible syntonization. It's a mix of the two of that. Because at the difference of uh, the the craftsman of or woman craftswoman, there is um, they don't, the the actor or the actress don't work to get alone. The public is looking at, at them, so the self is concerned with that gaze around them. So if their kokoro is not well fit, well settled, it will move. It will so they, they have to, to stay also in their in their sensitiveness. They have to be well well prepared in a way. And the, the last one is a uh, I will treat now, but you can know more about in this paper. In it, it's about the martial arts in judo, for example. I I choose judo especially. In the practice of all martial arts, there is kata. And the kata is, a, is not only a way of moving the, the body and, and air around the hands or, or around the body. It's also, when you get waza, you will also move the ki. You will also move vital, vital energy, cosmic breath. That is getting the waza in martial arts. Something other than matter and uh, and wind is moving. So the and the, the judoka is uh, the ka means uh, the, the house. The kanji for judoka is the kanji for house. And uh, ju means flexibility. So the, and do is a way. The way. So the, the the judoka is someone who is housing the way of flexibility. And, and I, I will allow, allow me uh, play with words. 
because what I'm trying to be, what I am trying, train, training myself is to be, to be a fudoka. I'm trying to be a fudoka. So that, that is someone who, who breed fudo, someone who allow nature, who, is, who, who go along with nature for fudoing. And uh, in, you know, just another play with word, in, in judo, we, with the place to practice judo is named a dojo. And uh, I, when I'm gardening, I'm, I'm, I'm attempting to create a food dojo. <laughs> so I'm a food dojo in food dojo. I, I unfold my content. My the next one, after this small, so, so waza is a way of creating fudo. And another way, after waza and the art of crafting, of craft, in permaculture, the art of graft, that is of, uh, it is some, graft is a, uh, En français, for, for French, who, it's a rare word, so it's uh, greffé. Um, how do we graft our existence to the earth? In the, in the small village where I live now, I met um, a, a man who is now my friend. His name is Masumi uh, Oyadomali. And um, he he's a farmer now. He's a farmer in natural farming. And uh, we spent two years talking every week, one hour together about uh, his life. And uh, now around 10 years ago, he met a natural famous, quite famous natural farmer in Japan who became his sensei. And uh, in the garden of that, uh, the name is Takahashi Sensei, of, the, of that man, he, uh, he felt a, a feeling, what he called a feeling of unity. So he, he, was, he was working in, the, in that garden and he felt the feeling of unity. And uh, at that moment, he, uh, he, uh, he changed his life. In Japan, the neighborhood enter your house <laughs> to, to, to catch you. Um, so, and uh, he changed his life to he was an engineer and uh, he became a farmer, a natural farmer. And uh, in permaculture, we decided I decided to translate uh, Shizen no Ho, which is normally translated by natural farming, by permaculture, permaculture in France, putting two C. So we spell it with two C. And for me, it was really important to add those two C and I had to fight a little to, to maintain those two C uh, in, the, in the paper because the, 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 the word to do, doing so, the word is not linked to culture, to culture, but to acculturation, to, to, to acculturation. It is not a way to cultivate nature. nature. It's, a, it's a way to acculturate ourselves with nature. It's a, it's a kind of decolonization that uh, Sander will speak about after. And uh, I think it's really important. We are not uh, in a relation over nature, cultivating it and deciding it. We are at the same level in it, in a process of um, acculturation. And um, um, the, 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 the permaculture is a, I just, I, I see there is only 
five minutes, so I will go to, but it's a question of rhythm. The rhythm of, of humans are very, very uh, quick. And uh, the, the, the rhythm of, of the soil of earth is very low. And the way to, to, to be in relation with earth cannot be direct. We need a clutch. We need, we need um, an embrayage, we say in mythology. We need a clutch to link that high speed existence and the low speed existence of the earth, of the souls. And in between, we need, we need other existence to be there. We need the speed of the trees. We need the speed of life, of existence, of, every, of everything. And even of the stones, very slow <laughs> rhythm of the stones. We need to be not direct working on the earth. We need all the other agencies, non-human agencies between us and the, the soils. It, uh, it brings me to see the, the word fudo in another way I never considered before. Fudo is, is, uh, is made with uh, kanji for the for kanji for um, the wind and the kanji for the, the earth. The wind has a very high level. It's very volatile. It's, it don't stay in place. And the earth is grounded. It's very low. So fudo is, is already a question of rhythm, of, of adequation between, between two very different kind of rhythm, speed of rhythm. So when we work on a, on a, in gardening, even in when I will call uh, uh, organic gardening, no, different from what I, what I experiencing here with, uh, with uh, Masumi. This is uh, because if we only uh, want to, to take care of uh, the garden, we don't, we, we, there is deep cultural uh, structures that we don't know about, that are still working, that, that, that are still uh, uh, deciding how to be in relation with the gardens. For example, we will, we will train regiments of ladybugs, mercenaries, to send them to the battlefield of, uh, to fight a field. We are bringing war in the garden. It is an organic way to take uh, ladybugs <laughs> and to put them to fight a puceron, a field. Uh, but it's uh, bringing war in the garden that way. And also there is a kind of eugenism when we will select the, the, the grains, the seeds, the, only the, the big one, the, the, the one with, that brings big vegetables or that are very strong. But, and uh, we are, it's eugenism. We don't allow it in other, other places, in other. We will, uh, we will always, we are always moved by a desire of mastering. And uh, the, the aesthetics of the tabula rasa is really strong, really, really strong. If there is bad, bad, bad uh, weeds or so, so called bad weeds, it's not beautiful. The, the tabula rasa remains the best. And the, 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 the perspective also is really strong. The need of perspective of symmetry, of geometry. We, 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 it is even in the, in the, in the uh, photography shown by Ono the sensei before in the, in the garden, it is, it is uh, on the same line, uh, the tomatoes, uh, behind the tomatoes, I think. Uh, and so on, we, we are speed dating also between tomatoes and potatoes because they, they are supposed to, 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 to have common, hobbies and so on so the, and the, the efficiency also is really really strong and also the the archetype of the eden no we, we, you will get no plastics and so you don't participate to, to the treatment of plastic it's, it's an other place place 
it's a kind of Eden of paradise. So we, we will do it really, really clean with no, no garbage. So let, uh, let's go to the conclusion. Uh, how can I train myself to become a food opa? Food opa. How can my garden become food dojo? Food dojo. At the level of the direct experience, we can leave moments of technical synchronization, waza, and of sen sen sensitive synchronization, kokoro. But the elaboration of this experience into a method, a method we may call mesography, requires, in my opinion, first of all, to actively engage, and this is not easy at all, in a process of decolonization of our practices, of our logics, of our desires, and of our, our aesthetics. This recalibration of our cultural heritage, heritage is necessary, I believe, to be able to coexist with other earthly existences and to acculturate with each other rather than cultivate them. The world is readable, yet it is not a text, and even less a text written for humans. But it is an inexhaustible source of astonishment, an inexhaustible source of human, animal, vegetable, geological, and cosmological stories. And those stories, each existence tells them with gestures, sounds, looks, see today. Thank you. Okay, Johan, thank you very much for your presentation and especially for ending uh, on, on that note because um, there you turn back to some of the central themes of the symposium so far um, and also um, in the idea of decolonizing even our uh, aesthetics um, uh, uh, relate to, uh, I think, the presentations of Ono-san and, uh, and Honda-san. Uh, and so I hope we can come back to these ideas uh, in the discussion time. But for the moment, um, I would like to thank you for your presentation and we keep moving uh, forward with our final presentation of the day. And that is from uh, Carolyn Darrow. Carolyn, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Okay, wonderful. Hello. It's nice to see you there. Carolyn, you join us uh, from France, from uh, the Morvan, is that true? Yes, it's true. Great. So um, Carolyn is an anthropologist and a director of the House of Oral Patrimony of Bourgogne, and um, also involved in the regional Morvan Echo Museum. We've had several uh, people uh, in the symposium engaged with museums. And so it's nice to see, um, to have one more um, representative of that, uh, that type of engagement. And Carolyn's, um, um, one of Carolyn's central interests is in the oral culture. And your next research project is very interesting on the fabric the social, the oral social fabric, we should, we should say. Uh, and today we'll present on the idea of Plecher the Living, a research hypothesis for the future of traditional ecological techniques in the Morvan. So Carolyn, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we are not a museum. It's for that I will present my, um, my proposition. I want to thank the symposium organization and particularly Frédéric Julien for his invitation. Um, this communication will attempt to reconnect oral practices and human animal plant relationships here in the Morvan in a global perspective. The Maison du Patrimoine Oral de Bourgogne in French is an ethnopole of the French Ministry of Culture a center for ethnological and artistic research on orality. We are located in a small village. Uh, here there is trees before me. Uh, the Morvan is a beautiful but underpopulated rural area in the center of France. Our research considers 
countryside as a center from which to think the world. The center of France has been perceived as a sort of empty space. During the 20th century, 70% of the local population has left their village to go to the city, mostly for, for factory work. I remember this old woman, Josephine, who said, we used to meet others to harvest or to bake bread. And a couple of years later, all these humans and their domestic animals have totally disappeared, as like after a cataclysm. The majority of men and young women disappeared, leaving mostly old women behind. In the 17s came a change. New small communities wanted a switch of point of views on culture and rurality. Despite their small number, the misunderstandings and disqualification of their casual language, number of local artists, musicians, storytellers, and local craftsmen wanted their traditional oral practices to be taken in account as a culture. A community movement came forward and ended up founding the MPOB, Center for Oral Heritage of Burgundy 12 years ago. Our work is to qualify what is seen and heard by the local population in the void and the silence. These humans perceive a world of presences and sounds. I will describe our local, local experience as perspectives for staying on earth. Firstly, it's necessary necessary to explore together the density of the rural void. In the second part, we will define what orality is for the Maison du Patrimoine Oral de Bourgogne and how orality makes presences appear and builds communities. In the third part, we will present a collective traditional ecological technique called Plichy. Considering the departure of, um, no, sorry, it's not. Uh, in my conclusion, yes, a speculative figure will attempt to anticipate new relationships between humans and non humans based on the art of ongoingness. My first part, uh, I, my PowerPoint, I have some photos for you. Okay, three parts. Oh. Yes. Uh, first part, explore the density of the rural void. All women and peasants' families who stayed in the Morvan were able to show us the density of their milieu. How winter snow, the cry of the owl, or screaming wild cats are a company in this human void. Josephine, who lived through the cataclysmic exodus in a hamlet near the village of Montsouche, crafted reed toys for little children. In the Morvan are a great number of wetlands where reeds grow even after four years of drought. Josephine knew where to find reed. She knew how to preserve its freshness to make artifacts, but above all, she had the ability of breeding with reed. When she made a rattle, she invited a baby to smell and touch, to hear and to taste the material as a miniature world that the child activated with its own hand. We have a lot of literature about uncrafted waters. All of this has been forgotten in the Morvan, but many grown up children still remember the taste of the sun and the sound of reed. And there are still green instruments, simpler, but made by children themselves. Like, like dandelion step trumpets or holy leaf whistles. I remember the acrid taste of dandelion when I made music with my green trumpet. For me, a salad bowl full of dandelion is a potential orchestra. How about you? 
Do you see music in your meadows? You may imagine now how wetlands, grassland, and forests are absolutely no empty. Another old person that we have known is Maurice, who survived the rural exodus in a hamlet near the little city of Epinac. During his youth, Maurice had to keep the flock. During his long shepherd's days, Maurice made himself familiar with the little things he saw around. He became able to imitate a great number of birds and he learned the sense of their whistles. For each bird, he knew an idiomatic phrase to translate the specific sound of the whistle. Such an oral technique is impossible if you do not have many birds in your ears. Maurice also knew all about tiolage, another oral technique, which is a sort of litany wanting to work with oxen. You can't make a cow obey with leather straps or horse bit. As a human, you must learn it the cow's way, and that is tiolage. Maybe is a nombriage. Come, uh, like um, as 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 uh, uh, Johan says. A half song, half spoken expression to encourage animals. Here is an example. No, why? Do you hear anything? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Authority is no use with cattle. They are stronger than you and they know it. Humans had to adjust their way of communicating and adopted this tiolage in order to gently push the animals to turn right, to turn left, or to move forward despite obstacles. They produced this very particular work song with their voice, as if animals and humans were together in the same effort. When Josephine made reed toys, she didn't just make artifacts. When making birds speak or singing with cattle, Morris did not anthropomorphize nature. They opened their perception of the density of the milieu and ours too. The perception of our surroundings is enriched by multiple points of view. Relationships between humans and non-humans become a dense network. Through orality, we are able to access other perspectives. In the Maison du Patrimoine Oral de Bourgogne, we work together, researchers, mediators, professional artists, amateurs, and inhabitants to experience the density of our current popular culture through orality. We can find possibilities to stay on earth if we take this density into account again. My part two, to make presences appear, what is mean, what is means to practice orality? For us, orality refers to the possibility to activate a past when an encounter occurs. In other words, to practice orality means taking into account the test of reed, wetlands, birds, cattle, gestures, voices, all together. Local storytellers explain that more precisely. When I talk and put in my mouth words of my ancestor or dead people, Suddenly, they were here, behind my shoulder. 
At the end of the story, they are decades behind me and they do not always agree with me. They can contest me or even fight with me. So I, can't, I, can't, I cannot say anything. I am responsible before persons that are alive, but also the no more alive. In this way, I think that this responsibility in oral practices is in fact very near the Donna Arrower concept of responsibility in two worlds. Responsibility is about both absence and presence. We must become liable for our deeds towards other humans and species on earth. Orality is one way to do that, I think. For Donna Arrowe, the past and the future are not helpful to live in our troubled times. To be responsible requires learning to be truly present. And to be tru truly present is what is at stake in orality, to stay in, in the uncertain moment between resurgence and ongoingness. Orality is this technical approach that puts into the same space all past, present, future presences. Orality is an activator of human and non-human presences, alive or not alive anymore. We consider that oral arts are this performative possibility always reinvented. As for us, we keep the record of these popular arts, which are free for everybody and have come up in uh, uniting and yet inclusive communities. Part three, Plessy, a speculative figure of an art of ongoingness. Among ecological traditional techniques, only one is collective and keeps plant alive, the pleshi. Pleshi is the translation of a pleached head in regional language. It names a technique of making living hedges by tapping and bending branches that are woven together to grow into a thick protective hedge that delimits forests, fields, and gardens. All kinds of trees in the surroundings used to be pleached, such as hazel tree, blackthorn, or holly. This labor was usually done in winter time by the peasants when sap streams stop and trees are sleeping. Nowadays, this technique is seen as archaic, as a leftover of an ancient rural world that disappeared after World War II when hedges were gradually replaced by barbed wire. Walking, uh, walking on ancient forest path, we can still see old trees which have been pleached, pleached a long time ago, this. Pleaching hedges in place, very good knowledge of the technique as well as of the milieu. The technical gesture of tapping must be precise enough not to cut the branch in order to let it live and grow. The aim is to obtain several ramified branches to densify the hedge. When the hedge is thick enough, it's more difficult for wild animals like boar to enter the meadow. The role of edges is not only to delimit an area, but it can also be productive. In opposite to dead hedges, living hedges may produce small wood to light fire. Fruit trees were also present in hedges, producing chestnuts, apples, and peas for the family or to feed pigs. At the beginning of the 20th century, every peasant family was self-sufficient. A hedge becomes a horizontal support for nests and dense or uh, and dense, or a blackberry stuck in late summer. It offers a wonderful symbiosis for mushrooms, small trees, and water. A pleach hedge is like an interspecies basket filled with resources for human and non-human life. The, in the invention of storage recipients represents for humans and non-humans a critical step toward the ability to build up stocks to hold out. The necessity to contain various things brings a variety of crafty crafty crafting techniques, also like basketry. This is a large study field in the anthropology of techniques. Considering the hedge 
as an inter species crafting technique, we bring on a research hypothesis how pleached hedges reveal a human and non human coexistence. In order to pleach, two or three humans must imagine together what the hedge will become based on what they know and saw about hedges that were pleached in the past. The process leaves a great deal of uncertainty as living beings can be unpredictable. When pleaching a hedge, humans speculate on the future of plants and animals that inhabit and will inhabit the milieu. They perform an ecological anticipation. They weave the past, their knowledge and experience of hedges with the future. Will the shrubs grow? Will animals take shelter? On what relationships can we count to plead the living? Invitation as in the teolage, imitation, childhood resurgence. We must render the orality of pleasing as it was before it disappeared due to the use of barbed wire. To conclude, we can consider the plishi as an art to craft interspecies basket with living plants and non-domestic animals. The person that pleaches is in fact at a balancing point between what he remembers about the way it will grow and the way he can influence the growth between what he can anticipate about non-domestic animals and his will to contain stocks. Through orality, all these presences can occur, past and present. Therefore, orality and technical gestures from art form arts, partly intangible, that allow the milieu to go on. Tiolage, pléchi, and bird song imitation exist in other countries with other names, with other humans and non-humans. We won't call them arts of ongoingness. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Carolyn, for this paper and discussion of the oral dimension of the traditional landscape in uh, central France. It's very interesting what you say, and especially um, I am struck by the sounds, uh, the voice, the technique of calling, of speaking uh, to the cows. And I wondered uh, if uh, perhaps um, I know Frederick is there and he might, um, I might ask him if in his experience with primates um, that people have ways, of course primates are not domesticated animal, but if people have ways also to speak uh, to primates um, or to interpret, um, uh, yeah, to maybe to speak to them. But Carolyn, I, I want to ask, is that, um, a technique of, of calling uh, to cows still practiced at all, still known by people? Is it part of your work to keep those uh, that kind of language alive? Um, now, now, tiolage. Um, uh, um, is not pra pra practiced anymore in the Morvan, but in another country, countries maybe uh, in Africa, I think, I, I see that, I hear that. Uh, here is the, uh, la trace. Uh, it, it's, it's just a, a, an archaic um, technique and uh, some peasants, some people, some artists uh, do that, but uh, without uh, real cows, because we have not cows anymore to work in uh, the fields, for example. And, and so it's very difficult, it's a very challenge to, to, to try uh, 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 a, a song of tiolage, because you you must imagine the cows, or you must be um, do outside. Outside, you must be outside near cows, near animals, 
to 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 see what what our our voice make for animals it's very it's very complicated uh, without the the real um uh, context of this song and so uh, what is what what is researched by the song is um it, the, these presences and so we, we we try to 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 re reenact we try to uh, create recreate a relationships between uh, outside, between an uh, outside work, between animals and humans, between other, because when you think, when you sing uh, outside, uh, um, birds uh, uh, are here too. I, I heard uh, a bird, uh, for example, no nightingales. I, I, I don't see, I don't, I don't know anymore, but um, a bird can imitate you when you are singing for cows. And all of this is very interesting for to, to, to staying on earth, I think. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Maybe we go um, now, we can go to the general discussion. And so if we bring all of our speakers onto the screen here, we can see each other more easily. I see Echo and there, Onosan and Johan. Great. Okay, we are all there. Yes, Echo, you have a hand raised. You would like to make a comment, please. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to ask uh, Johan a brief question about uh, pharmaculture a culture uh, which is fascinating and uh, your idea of hoodwing and uh, I wondered if you could uh, briefly expand on what what does it look like or what does it sound like feel like since these are the are very conceptual uh, uh, ideas that you discussed and uh, yeah thank you yeah what it looks like it's uh, there is two kind of landscape. There is an inner side landscape, which is a moving, a really moving one. We are moved by doing this, by practicing. But also, we are also moved by practicing uh, uh, permaculture or other kind of uh, natural agriculture. But uh, we are mo moving inside uh, to, uh, to, to the, when we, when you, <laughs> you stop, my cat is, Fighting with me, uh, when when you we stop to trying to control, you need to be confident. So you are connecting to confidence with nature, which is which is not <laughs> that easy because when there is an invasion invasion of bugs or some or something that goes wrong or a, a typhoon uh, coming and pushing all the the, the rice uh, down. You, it's it's hard to be confident, but uh, the, the so the in, inner landscape is moving to to the to other kind of affects, and uh, in the in the field it's the other the other desire we get is the the, the for universalism. We 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 would like to get to 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 show some uh, rules. Some concrete words and to and those words to be to to works on uh, every kind of food, but but the, 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 that words it, it's a kind of relationship. Uh, there is no rules no rules for for love to each for loving someone else, and in the same in the same manner there is no real rules for the, for to enter in 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 in, in relation with. With the place, there it's uh, something you build by yourself with your own history, with the history of that place, and with, with your own needs, and with the needs of that place, and with the inhabitants that are already here, and with the migrants coming because there is also migrants that we that were not that was 
not living here, but if there is some parts of bush in your garden, there is other kind of species coming, vegeta vegetables and uh, animal species coming. So it's a, it's a really moving one. So it's a kind of wandering in the two, in the two sense of the world. It's a wandering, so you, you are reconnecting with the, the, the attention to the world and uh, you are also uh, wondering what to do uh, every time and uh, who, what that plants. And we, yeah, the, the, the social network is also very important. We are, it's like uh, Caroline says, just said now, it's, uh, you need the, you need the, the coal, you need the, the work to work with the, that coal. So you need the uh, tires uh, to tire with that coal. It's a, it's a, it's a poodle. And uh, Augustin Berg worked on that kind of uh, transformation of poodle on his PhD thesis in uh, Hokkaido, when, uh, when the, with the transformation, uh, to the, the, with the, when people, when Hokkaido people wanted to, to grow, um, uh, rice is there uh, or, 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 or wheat uh, there. And so they, 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 they were bringing the Holland food, all the, the hat, everything from, uh, from Holland to, to, to grow cows in Hokkaido. And it's very interesting. And in a way, it's, it's not, it's a good, it's a good way of seeing things. So I, yeah, it's a very interesting question, uh, Honda Sensei. I, it's hard for me to, to tell you what it looks like. But for example, uh, one week ago, some a friend uh, proposed me tires of his, of his uh, kuruma, uh, of his uh, car, and uh, and I accept the four the four, the, the four tires. So I, I also negotiate with the uh, garbage in my own garden. And uh, I, I, I also, uh, I, I try not to fall in the archetype of the Eden and to, 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 to get like, uh, because, because tires are also housing uh, spaces and the work of my fudo uh, that what works in my fudo, in my garden, should work also in other places. And there is a lot of tires every, everywhere. So I'm, in a way, I'm, I'm developing fudo in, in that garden, e even fudo for tires, for uh, rubber tire. And uh, so, and, but uh, Masumi's garden is different from mine and uh, Takahashi sensei is different from mine. We, but uh, we are, but the, perhaps the inner, the inner landscape is more common. Is more common. We as we because the the cultural land, uh, the cultural landscape, the civilization landscape is more common, perhaps. And we are we are fighting with uh, uh, Isabel Stanger say we are ruminating like a cow, you know, to to. To make milk from uh, from from weed, we we take it one time, and it go to, to to the intestine, and we come back and we again, and then we can we can we can make we can um, uh, make it our body uh, through our body. But uh, so we are ruminating a similar. Uh, also, in the when we come to the countryside, the, the presence of uh, death is really, really close. It's, it's, day, it's a daily experience. Even today, uh, uh, a mouse on my tatami, hit <laughs> uh, by the cat. But uh, because we are, it's more intense. Because we are, we are, we are breed, uh, breeding relations with livings. And those livings are dying, and uh, it's it's a normal it's a normal cycle. But we are confronted to to the death of uh, of uh, important livings for us in a way. So we it's a uh, and this is common for all permaculture. Thank I, you. Thank you. Thank you, Ikatan. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Johan, and uh, Eko for the question. Frederick, you have your husband hand raised. Yes, uh, um, but Augusta also just before me, so uh, I can uh, I can just go quick. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, Caroline uh, or no, per perhaps Ono in, in that sense. Ono first, uh, if you um, Tadashi, could you tell us a little more? Uh, on the link you can make between Shibata uh, work and your own work, um, and how you relate uh, what you did on on Toku, on walls, and um, and what you are doing on gardens, uh, picturing right now, because I don't see exactly the link uh, you 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 made between. Or perhaps you don't make any any link, but to make uh, the link you make with this type <laughs> of artifacts, and the question for yes, Caroline I mean. artifact too. So this man, well the well I don't say there's no link between them. Shivata's works. Um, actually, uh, our generation is a bit different. There's a gap of generation by like 12 years or 10 years, and Shibata pay more attention to forms compared to my works. And uh, Shibata comes from the uh, printing, um, printing work, hanga. So rather than critics itself, um, looking at the contra concrete structures, uh, well, the, to Sivata, those are scu 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 sculptures, and he doesn't capture the sky in he, into his work. So it's like a type of garden. It's like an enclosed garden, hakoniwa, in Japanese sense, and um, he. Uh, well, has a very uh, black and sh black and white and high quality art artwork. Today I showed you the uh, colored version, but uh, their work is uh, his work is more like a uh, craft. To that, uh, more than form. Uh, in my case, of course, uh, form is very important in paintings and photographs, but uh, in my case, I try to focus on the uh, relationship. Uh, of the scenery or the landscape. Coastal motif is the title of my um, work. Uh, so this proves the fact that uh, I want to take everything uh, in the coastal line in an equal manner. So the plants and the sea walls and the people and the roads, ev everything or anything in the photograph uh, should be uh, handled uh, equally. equally. Uh, that is my attitude, and I think that is the difference between myself and Shibata. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I don't see um, Augustin's question here. I don't see him on the on the sheet. And so, Frederick, um, oh, there you are. Okay, good. Did, did you have a question then? Yes, the, well, it's not really a question, but uh, uh, I would like to go back over the the happening which occurred during uh, Johan's presentation. Someone came in mm. in his house and he was obliged to go there to talk with a person. Uh, this is quite impossible in a, for in a Western house to come in, but only in the Genkan. There is an intermediate uh, room on the on the, the the level of the of the of the earth itself, but not the floor. So you know that difference. And this is really um, the question I think also, uh, which relates with uh, Honda San, the, the pre presentation of what you call queer nature, because. Queer nature, uh, the Japanese uh, kotono, ko, the space of koto, is it? Was it? Was it that? Well, 
what you called uh, would translate it in English with yeah sure uh, so uh, the I haven't really came up with the uh, Japanese translation of the idea of queer nature because I uh, conceptualize the notion while working through both uh, English and Japanese primary sources written by him and uh, with an aim to communicate it to English audience. And so I looked into also a history of the term queer and how uh, diverse the, me the, the term actually meaning it carried and it all fitted, that sort of rightly summarized it. And uh, so I haven't came up with a Japanese direct translation yet, but uh, the idea of koto no gaku uh, is the, the uh, masahiro san brought up earlier, and that, that uh, phenomenological theory, uh, he arrived at a slightly later stage, uh, a few years on after he left um, the US to the UK, and the emerging conversation with the uh, Buddhist monk Toki Horyu, who went on to the become the head priest of the Shingon Buddhism later in his life. And uh, so they, yeah, they, 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 they're not exactly the same, but like the, uh, how I presented queer nature and the Buddhist science in my presentation, uh, I, I would say, argue that it was more of a preliminary stage of how, he developed onto developed it into the um, this idea of koto no gaku. So oh, this is a there is a fundamental ambiguity in, in, in this word uh, koto and mono. You you know that in Japanese mono means both a thing and a person. So and uh, when someone came uh, in Yuan's house, home <laughs> penetrated. Uh, you know also that in Japanese, uh, the word uh, uchi, ka, ie, uh, it can be either the, the thing uh, which is a house, or it can be yourself. If you are a little girl uh, living in Osaka, then you, when you say uchi, it means yourself. So the, there is a, 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 this is a culture of interpenetration and um, of... Uh, well, of course, there are many Japanese words for saying that. But mainly, it's, it turns around the idea of aida, aida, which is present in the very word meanings a person, a human person, a person, ninge. And you know, the uh, Watsuji gave a very special uh, acceptation to the word ninge or jinkan, which means the the betweenness or interlink between hito. So this is a fun, fundament, fundamental tone or stimung uh, in, in German, uh, in, the, in Japanese culture, which was uh, negated by a Western modern, Western modern uh, culture, which is completely different with, with um, uh, what we have seen with uh, Caroline Daru's uh, presentation, because it was alive in uh, traditional uh, French or anywhere in the world, uh, traditional cultures, but which disappeared, was cut off by modernity. And we have to get it back to make again the, the interlink we have with the earth uh, for going, overcoming the disaster going on now in our present civilization. Yes, thank you very much for, for pointing out these connections. Uh, and Johan, did you want to follow there? Uh, it was a question for, for also for Eiko Honda. Um, it was about uh, Minakata. Uh, Kumagusu about his uh, he I I I I've read a book of, of him he was defending the the jinja and uh, the shrines and uh, he defended the, the the existence of shrines in the village in, in the Japanese villages because uh, of eco for ecological reasons he says because around the jinja around around the shrines there is a, an interpenetration, Aida, between 
human that 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 don't live there but come there some from time to time and uh, the the mostly the forest and uh, it uh, it makes it very specific on the level of uh, ecology and um, can you can you can do you know if uh, minakata also talk of uh, queer nature of uh, shrines in japan it, it, it did he also speak of shrines in in this perspective Oh, so um, thanks, Joan, for uh, asking me this question. Uh, it's actually a topic that I'm working on at the moment for uh, as a final chapter of a monograph on uh, Minakata Kumagusu. So uh, 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 I'd love to get back in touch and talk about it once it's done, because I'm still in the process of uh, uh, um, sort of creating, a, a generating a cohesive narrative around this topic, uh, um, but uh, certainly that, that's my approach uh, at the moment, but yes. Thank you. Frederick, would you continue? Sorry, your sound, Frederick. Yes, I wanted to, to ask Caroline about um, the pleshi and because what you raised in, in your talk, um, in fact, it's central for our reflection in, in, these, in these days. Um, and uh, 40 years ago, Leslie Oswald, an American uh, anthropologist, wrote a book on technology, on technologies, comparative technologies among, among in different cultures. And he, he make a clear distinction between artifacts and eco facts. And I think uh, you raised um, all the meaning of eco facts. And um, by your example and by different examples, I have some similar example with chimpanzee and first humans, and but also with different in different culture. In fact, it's a, it's a large um, in, in a large uh, enterprise, we can start uh, looking at those different eco facts because they are durable. Because all what you say on interlink, what uh, Augustin uh, raised with Ida, it's very important for comparative studies, in fact, and, and try to find uh, try, from traditional solutions other solutions uh, to, to face the crisis the Anthropocene, uh, Anthropocene crisis. So if you can say a little more uh, on the, the way you think about orality and material culture, uh, I would be very pleased. Thank you. Sorry, I was wrong. Okay, I will try. Um, maybe uh, um, I can say that uh, I, I, be, I begin uh, 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 saying that we are not a museum here. Uh, we are a non-profit organization, but there is a lot of museums around us, museums uh, in which you can find uh, read, you can find rattled, you can find uh, uh, yokes, a uh, lot of artifacts. But uh, in France, there is a problem uh, we we can talk uh, talk about intangible cultural heritage. In French public policies, we know how to keep uh, photos, videos, uh, yokes, uh, ancient uh, houses, but uh, there is a real problem because um, uh, to activate the density of the milieu. Uh, communities communities um, need their native language, for example. They need uh, tracks and paths uh, to practice their, their surrounding. Uh, they need to be able to support their family. They need schools for their children, for example. There is in France a problem. We, 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 uh, comment dire? On, 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 uh, uh, Politic publis uh, uh, patrimonialization is on artifacts, but not on uh, density <coughs> of the milieu. And here we uh, make the cho the choice uh, do, to not uh, keep any uh, artifacts. 
we have just uh, intangible things. We are artists, we are um, uh, spectaculars from, we are, we remake things with other. Uh, and um, uh, I think in France, uh, it's important to, 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 to work on, on really, really on intangible and not on artifacts uh, uh, fa too fast because artifacts are all, all over us. Uh, so um, uh, I prefer, um, I prefer um, uh, uh, um, I, I want to see presences uh, before all. I want to see presences when, when anything uh, is uh, happening and, and after, we can see how these presences um, uh, are, are making embryage between, between uh, human and non-humans. And after, we can see artifacts. Artifacts are, uh, are like um, uh, a testimony, maybe, between, uh, on, uh, on the, 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 the links between, we can, we can uh, uh, craft between human and non-humans. It's not really easy for me in English, you know? <laughs> and the question is difficult. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for, for struggling to articulate this uh, central idea that we have discussed also in other sessions. Um, the need uh, to cross some of these boundaries between the material and the immaterial, between the living and the non-living, between the human and the animal, and so on. And this idea in this session of uh, the kokoro, the mind-heart, at being at the center of this uh, uh, this journey across uh, the boundaries, I think is a very uh, uh, fascinating one. And so, uh, unfortunately, we have come to the end of the session. In fact, we have gone over, and but we will continue again here in just about uh, 11 minutes. And so uh, I would like just now to thank all of our presenters today um, for your presentations, for your attention, uh, for your offerings, and also especially for keeping uh, the idea of the main, uh, the main idea of the session of renewal and of staying on earth here central in your, in your presentations. I appreciate your uh, your, your, your words very much, and I'd like to thank you very much and invite you to stay, of course, for the next uh, public session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, good evening, everyone, or good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to the final session uh, of the symposium, The Arts of Living with Nature, which is hosted uh, by the Research Institute for Humanity and Nature here in Kyoto, Japan, and also with the collaboration and support of the EHESS of France. Our colleague Frédéric Julien there in Marseille is with us tonight, as are many of his colleagues involved in the EHESS network. And uh, of course, I have uh, also here uh, the other main co-organizer, Professor Ale, who is here at the, in the discussion session tonight. Um, we've come to the end of five days, which have been really fascinating. And um, I think a, a real pleasure, uh, certainly for me, and I hope for you all. And I'd like to just very briefly to um, review a little bit of what we have done uh, uh, and some of the key ideas that we have um, raised and discussed uh, over these past days. And so I will just uh, share my screen here. Yes, here we are. So I think you must be well aware by now, but the, the idea, what are the, some of the key ideas in, embedded in this title, The Arts of Living with Nature? One of our main goals is to assert the value of real life vernacular and artistic traditions and practices that are found in Japan and elsewhere around the world. And to understand these as bodies of knowledge that exist alongside the human and the natural sciences and other kind of uh, forms of formalized knowledge. With the idea that asserting the value of these 
real life vernacular practices will enable a greater dialogue between the different regimes of knowledge and practice. And we have over these days really tried to emphasize, and in fact, we have had a number of fascinating presentations that these bodies of knowledge are embedded in the cultural realm. We have spoken quite a bit about gardens. We have spoken about food practices, about traditional arts, dance, and music, among other uh, cultural phenomena. And one of the key ideas that have kept coming, uh, emerging from these discussions, was that these arts of, of life always express knowledge about the natural world, about our relationships within it. And a key idea is that this type of knowledge of the natural world is relevant now to redirecting the ways that our societies live within the earth. So here is our basic uh, um, symposium structure. We began day one with um, a discussion that really focused on the idea of the garden. And one of the key ideas in, in that session um, with uh, Professor Yamagiba and Professor Sako, who are here again tonight with us, um, was the idea of gardens as sites of social exchange or as a, as a place uh, for human beings to talk with each other, to speak with each other, to communicate with each other, but also to communicate beyond the human realm. The garden in this sense was seen as a place or a kind or a way of communication and dialogue between the human and the non-human. Let's see, I get nothing on my next, oh, there we are. Okay, thank you. Um, and in the second day, the day of opening in which we considered the earthly intelligence, the idea of a, of a vernacular planetary knowledge, um, we discussed the problem that science oftentimes preclude the kind of communication that we have identified as being a key element of the garden. And the a second idea of this session was that we need more relational ways of knowing in order to cross the boundaries, to perceive the independences interdependencies between the human and the non-human, the living and the non-living, for example. And in this uh, discussion, uh, in the, the evening, there was a special um, focus on the, um, the, the, the approach to natural thought, the approach to thinking about nature in both East and West, and in particular, a focus on the idea of the arts, the root meanings of the arts. And Professor Augustin Burke posed the question, how do human beings arrange the juncture between themselves and the environment? The environment, which is itself considered a dynamic and relational thing. The process that we discussed there was one of a deep kind of discovery, a discovery of the outside and discovery of the inside, discovery of the external and discovery of the internal, and the process of self-creation through participation in the world. And we went on in day three to really speak about the question of the nature of this kind of participation. How is it that we humans in our cultural ways interact with non-human logics, non-human patterns, frequencies, which exist out there in the world, which themselves create the relationships in which we are also involved, not only as objects, but also as subjects. A key idea there uh, we spoke about in very interesting ways were the needs to find new ways to listen, listen more carefully to the non-human realm. And here again, we turned uh, in day four, the idea of transformation, exploring the arts of nature, that arts, the arts themselves involve a reversal of the the, the subject object relationship that we oftentimes take for granted. And there was quite a bit of discussion of the need to leave the normal modes of perception and to engage in a much more bodily, sensuous experience with the world and to ask in a very direct way 
what happens to ourselves when we are seen by the plants, we are felt by the stones, understood by a gorilla or by a school of fishes, and heard by the gods. Here we came back again uh, several times to the idea of the garden, and I was reminded in particular of the discussion of uh, Mr. Ogawa, who is the um, 12th generational gardener, who spoke in particular about the communication, how the garden can allow communication with the ancestors. And in fact, he spoke several times about the stones and the trees as his own elders, that is, as a kind of ancestor themselves. And the garden is a way of, um, of, of interacting with them, of hearing from them, and asking the question, we must ask the question of ourselves these days, of whether we are able to receive what they are giving to us. Because there was also the, the comment last night, I believe it was Hasegosan, uh, who is here with us again tonight, who asked, who, who said that what is inherited can be renewed. And indeed, that is the topic of uh, our day, our fifth day here. And uh, we have just had um, an interesting discussion um, about the tools, uh, the concepts, the methods um, that are used in the process of perception and collaboration in the kind of middle ground between the inside and the outside and the ways of and, and, and different ways of thinking about uh, how we see, how we learn, how we do, that reveal something about our very selves, that in a way that also uh, very much connects us to the non-human realm. And so here uh, in the fifth session, we have come uh, to the end of the kind of formal proceedings, but actually uh, we prefer not to say the end, but in a sense, a kind of renewal, a kind of a time uh, to reconsider what we have spoken, uh, what we have discussed, what we have thought, and uh, to begin again. And so with that, I'd like to pass on to my colleague, Professor Ave. Daniel, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So uh, we are in this uh, townhouse of Kyoto. And in this uh, studio venue, we have uh, three uh, participants. Uh, in terms of dialogue, uh, we had uh, the head of uh, RIN, uh, Yamagiwa Juichi-san, and uh, also uh, president of Kyoto Seika University, uh, Sako O-san. And also yesterday, who spoke, uh, Hasegawa-san. These three uh, people are here with us today. And also on the other side of the screen, uh, Augustan uh, Belk-san uh, and many more uh, participating. So as Daniel has just said, so uh, it should be uh, Kisho Tenketsu. The fourth uh, part uh, should have been a conclusion, but we are not uh, coming, we are not uh, using the word conclusion, but renewal. It is going to be a starting point of uh, something that we will be heading towards uh, going forward. So uh, in starting this uh, renewal part, uh, we would like to uh, ask uh, uh, Sander Van Du Levue to speak. All and right. He used to be an archaeologist. So if I start introducing starting from him as being an archaeologist, it's going to take a long time. Therefore, I'd like to briefly introduce um, Sandra Sam. He's in the interdisciplinary project. Well, to deal with a challenge in the disciplinary approach is being used nowadays. This is a kind of a no nowadays. RIN is one of the interdisciplinary research institutes. However, that within the academic community, the Sandel initiated for the first time in the disciplinary project. He noticed importance of such research and he has led such a research but he, so and he um, also 
has been involved in the RIND activity, and he was the chair of external evaluation committee for the RIND. So we call it ex external evaluation committee. Maybe external is not the right word because uh, they are our friends. They are internal people. So, so they are not um, external people. They are internal people in that sense. So without uh, further ado, I, I do I'd like to turn over to Sandel Sam. And I think we, you have been listening to our sessions. Uh, so I'd like ask you to um, give us uh, your keynote for the final session. So Sandel Sam, please start. All right, I will start. Just hold on for a second so that I will put my PowerPoint up there. Uh, right here, share. You can see what I have. All right, now like, let's do one more thing. All right. So, most of my work has been on sustainability. And so much of what I will talk about today is from a sustainability perspective. But as Abe-san said, my background is in archaeology and in European medieval history. And I am, since a couple of months, retired from Arizona State University as a professor of sustainability. All that being said, I want to first express that I am incredibly impressed by this particular symposium. I have learned a huge lot. And that for me is the hallmark of a good symposium. So I want to thank all of you speakers, but also the translators, the organizers, the technicians for making this in such a very successful thing. For me, it is a big step forward in my own sustainability thinking. But, and you'll find out later, I haven't digested it all. Some of it is just little points that I've connected with, okay? So my presentation is also very much a work in progress. It's part of an ongoing thinking about the problems created by Euro-American approach to science, uh, the opportunities created by Japanese ideas as we had in this particular uh, symposium. And my starting point is that from a sustainability perspective, the Euro-American way of looking at things is a dead end. And we have to get out of it or we'll go down with it. And so the first part of my presentation, I want to raise three questions. How did that Euro-American thinking develop? and what are its effects? How did it spread across the world? Hold on, I better get... How did it spread across the world? And thirdly, how can East Asian and Japanese thinking help improve the situation? I will have to generalize and move very fast to cover this. So forgive me if I misinterpret some of your ideas. But in order to at least make sure that you get the main idea, I will start with a summary. And it, the summary basically says the following. Climate change or environmental change are not really the core challenges of the present period. The fundamental imbalance, they are part of a much wider issue. And we must tackle that much wider issue. The fundamental imbalance in many domains is between the North and the South hemispheres. These are economic and political, but also educational concerning health and so on and so forth. And the ICT revolution, the revolution in communications and informatics has actually made these differences much more visible, which has led to tensions inside the Euro-American societies and between developed and developing nations. 
We have seen independence movements, identity issues, populism, racial tensions, wealth discrepancies, and a whole bunch of red signals that we cannot go on like this. In the environment, this development has led to imbalances in resource use, in pollution, and so on and so forth. And you'll see some of that on the next slide. Overall, we are also exceeding planetary boundaries. So as Einstein once argued, you can't solve the problems you created the same way of thinking that you are applying. And so basically, we need to decolonize our minds. And part of that is the decolonization of the concept of nature. And I think all of you have shown me over the last few days how rich the, the rewards are once you really do that. So here, just to start off, if you compare gardens in different parts of the world, they're all very different. They show the impact of human thinking on the environment. In between Britain and France, I have lived in both, there is a big difference between the empiricist vision in Britain and the Cartesian vision in France, which are here represented on the left, the English, and on the right, the French. I'm simply showing that because culture and nature have co-evolved together into their present states. And to understand the differences, we need to look at the culture's evolutionary trajectories. And to make this point even stronger, I made two photos in the Republic of Mongolia and in Chinese Inner Mongolia and showed the difference here left between left and right. And I want to argue that what is called modernization is in fact colonization by Euro-American culture. So let's look intellectually at how that approach emerged in Euro-American societies. In the 14th century, we have this big plague epidemic. And because so many people died, two things fundamentally changed in people's thinking. On the one hand, the cycle of birth and death was dismembered because the accent was so strongly about the death of individuals that from a cyclical perspective on time and on how the seasons evolved and everything else, we came to a linear perspective in which birth to death was the main trajectory. But the linearness has been really, really important for our thinking. We see all of that with a whole bunch of other things, such as the emergence of portraits, individual real portraits of signatures of clocks and things like that. In the couple of centuries after, we have in the Italian Renaissance, a huge development on the economic front, but which also had big impacts on how we saw society. Basically, what happened is that there is a transition from seeing commerce and interaction, interaction in a very general sense, initially as something that is relational and therefore long-term because relations persist. And that becomes a vision that is transactional in which the individual transaction, the exchange, for example, between money and wool is actually the thing that we study. And that means that we actually shorten our time perspective and that we no longer have the long-term relationships front and of our mind, but the actual immediate short-term relationships. But it also means that a lot of the relational structure of society is dissipating because we are no longer basing everything on family relations, community relations, or geographical, rela geographical proximity relations. That trend continues in the 15th and to 17th centuries when Protestantism and the bourgeoisie actually shift from an open, exploring, questions posing way of thinking to a way of thinking that affirms truth, that ex exploits particular values rather than question those. And that means that we begin to focus on entities, on individuals, on discrete categories that we can define 
in a particular way by referring to particular characteristics. Now that development keeps going in the few centuries after, and in the 18th century and in the 19th century, there is a move towards a Cartesian and empirical kind of rationalism, which means it's the emergence of science, it's the emergence of measurement, it's the emergence of a whole set of tools that try and create for us a particular vision of the world. But the important part of that is that that is a human cultural development. It is not an absolute. What we do in that process is we categorize natural phenomena. Linnaeus' classification of plants is a very good example, but there are many, many others, and I'll get to a couple more of those in a little while. So in the 19th century, technology becomes part of that, and it becomes part of the tools that we have to process information. One of the interesting examples is that once you've constructed a car, the person driving is only concerning how to drive, but no longer has to concern with the fact that the whole thing moves forward. So technology fixes by simplifying the interaction between humans and parts of their environment, fixes that environment. On top of that, in the mid 19th century, we see a very interesting change. Initially, for much of the Middle Ages, but also other societies, effectively, economy is a way to exchange things in a society. And so the society drives what happens and the economy is a tool. But in the mid 19th century, that shifts around. The economy becomes the purpose of Western society and the society is simply there to serve the economy. That means that we move from a system of comprehension where we understand the interactions between different ways of thinking, different ways of conceiving, the relationship between people and nature to a way in which we actually simply have a set of levers that make it possible for us to interact with all of that technology, because of course technology has no flexibility. And so the more you depend on technology, the more you render your whole society and your whole system actually inflexible. That also means that you get more and more categorization. And to raise a nasty topic, it means it is the period in which race theories develop. And in a paper that I've contributed to, we have demonstrated how that works in the late 19th century for dogs who suddenly are then given names of dog races, but it also applies to human beings. And then finally, in the 20th century, if I go on with this very short overview, we see the emergence of the global uh, product, industrial product, as actually the main measure in which you compare nations. Consumption is be becomes the driver of an expanding economy. Globalization is facilitated by transport and information flow and debt is created as a possibility to have people buy more. So that overall is the intellectual framework by which Euro-America got all that wealth. And I refer to a very interesting book by Joe Hendrick from Harvard about how these things worked. Now, the core things here are that the Euro-American world aligned a very, around a very specific set of material values. And may, most of that is to bring human, natural, and biological resources to the European core, and to gear all the efforts to increasing the relative value of materials and subjects in that society, and objects in that society. And then finally, in the 19th and 20th century, Euro American society is, considers itself at the service of the economy. It spreads wealth through a trickle-down system. It transforms into mass consumer society. 
it creates and maintains a huge wealth discrepancy between the poor and the rich, and it develops sophisticated institutions and technologies. In all of that, culture dominates nature. And I'll get back to the concept of a tangled hierarchy in a moment. But the idea is that nature can be tamed. Nature can be manipulated. Nature can be changed. Humans can do with nature what they want. And unfortunately, non-white populations are considered part of nature and can therefore be exploited. Now, this tangled hierarchy is a Western way of expressing some of the difficulties that we see here. To contrast what is happening is, and somebody said that in the symposium, but unfortunately, I don't remember who. In the West, nature is considered subject to culture. In East Asia and in Japan, and we've learned a lot of that in the last couple of days, for a few days, culture is considered inserted in nature. And so the question is of the, whether the Euro-American categorical perspective that in, in that context actually creates an opposition between nature and culture. And we see that from the 18th, 19th century in how the concept of natural history and the concept of cultural history actually develop as a sort of game of mirrors. So what we have in that process is that each concept that is looked at by a Western society actually is simplified. The number of dimensions that can be perceived are reduced. And I was very intrigued by the idea that visualization actually has become more important than all the other ways to perceive things. So we have also in that process an increasingly narrow focus on the subject and less on the context. And there is very interesting, hard scientific material to demonstrate that. Now, that is a, the categorical way to look at things. But in a relational perspective, you would not focus on the oppositions, but you would focus on the interactions. And so, as we have seen in the symposium, Ogawa-san pointed out that there is a tension, but no opposition between the two perspectives, the natural and the cultural. And that opening up of the categories allows for resonance, allows for empathy, for ambiguity, and for changes in perspective. So wider dimensionality of perception is, in general, paramount in that perspective. Now, uh, what has colonialism done? Colonialism can be divided in a very simplistic way in four main phase, phases. First, an exploratory phase, the 1600s and 1700s, in which we see trading colonies and slavery begin. But in the 1800s and 1900s, almost immediately when 1800 starts, we get a very different perspective because the European uh, perspective that has all the technology begins to see the colonies as things to exploit. It introduces Western values. It forces consumption. It creates plantations, mining, territorial occupation, administration, and so on. So there is material control. Sort of in the 20th century, and particularly sort of after the Second World War, that stops because many of the countries concerned have discovered that they should be asking for their independence, and that is given. But the economic dependency remains, and it remains to actually much larger period, maybe even till the present. Western economic values with a focus on wealth dominate. The awakening of identities, the lack of institutions, and the corruption allow the Western world to keep control over what is happening outside. But it means also that that is no longer controlled by countries, but it's controlled by private corporations. Now, the core message here is that this is where we are. But what is our next task? It is to deal 
with the information colonialism that has been going on all along, but that has become dominant since the 1980s. Because of IT, information has become portable. And so we see globalization and globalization of Western economic control with Western values, ideas, trade and finance. If we are going to actually get better from a sustainability perspective, we actually need to read, uh, no, I, before I get there, I should put this in first. The, in that process, the perception that other cultures have of nature, but in a very much more general sense, colonization and globalization require reduction of value dimensions. And so what we get is a global system that effectively thrives on the lowest common denominator between all those different cultures. And that lowest common denominator is GDP. And so in that process, we destroy the environment, we destroy our societies. And so my argument here, and for this group, group particularly, is that non-European cultures must rediscover their own values and their identities and shed this Western imposed kind of thinking. So we need to see the rising self-confidence in various places own values. That will lead to identity conflicts, of course, but I think that's something that we still have to simply have to deal with. We need to build national economies and independent institutions. And the next step in that is to actually shed Western colonial values, such as manifest destiny, civilizing as benefactors, Christian mission, GDP, globalization, and so forth. One of the problems with that is the information revolution, which is a sort of an ultimate way of binding the whole world to the Western perspective. So we need to rethink the relationship between global and local. We need to rethink a lot of what is happening in the information technology arena. So we need to decolonize our minds. And we see already a lot of decolonization in economic and political thinking. But the information colonialism is much more deeply integrated because it has corrupted the language, the concepts, the ways of thinking of non-Western societies. And to get rid of that is very difficult because you, it's very difficult to distinguish what is what because things have been adopted to different degrees and in different ways. So indigenous perspectives are very difficult to distinguish and to extricate from the overwhelming Western perspective that has been imposed. The absence of acknowledged conceptual leverage points is also a point, you know. Newton once said, I can move the earth out of its orbit if I have a fixed point to leverage it against. Well, this is the same thing. We don't have a fixed point to leverage any of this thinking against. And on top of that, there's good biological evidence that unlearning is more difficult than learning and that therefore there's lots of barriers to our changing. In a sustainable world, all societies must free their own thinking. They must recreate global, cultural, and biodiversity. We talk a lot about biodiversity. We don't really talk about cultural diversity. We need to integrate non-economic values. And a lot of what you have all said is actually all about that. We need to pay attention to qualitative dimensions and perceptions whereas the West has actually focused everything on quantitative and measurable. That doesn't really help. So decolonizing nature can happen everywhere. Nature is omnipresent. Nature has its own dynamic. Nature itself is apolitical, but impacted by politics and economics. And so we must change our perception rather than nature. And you have all talked a lot about the subject object change that is necessary for that. We need to revive pre-Euro-American concepts. Historical roots provide, can provide leverage points. Return to relational perspective humans as part of nature. Increase the dimensionality of perception, the complexity, 
of what we see and acknowledge as being seen. This has to do a lot with the lis listening that we talked about in the symposium. And Derek has made a number of very interesting points there that I'll get back to in a moment. So we need to re-emphasize open categories, questioning categories, rather than establishing truth categories. And a very interesting work that has been published a year ago is this work by uh, Gillian Tett, who is one of the chief editors of the Financial Times, but who is an anthropologist. And she looks at this in a business perspective. Of course, language is incredibly difficult in all of this because English is a colonizer's language and so is French and so is German and so is Dutch, my own language. And so what you see is when these languages, when things from other places are translated into those languages, they are not really translations. They are recreations. They are simplified recreations of the complexities of the languages involved. And in particular with Japanese, that for me has become very clear in this symposium. And I would argue that the East Asian perspective that is grounded in its Taoist, much more relational rather than categorical perspective is a great help because it inverts the relationship between subject and object. And Hamamura-san has actually talked about that. It also avoids the opposition between positive and negative because basically A and non-A are aspects of the same rather than opposites. I'll forget about the sticks for a moment. That takes too much time. We need to have make place for part understanding, for ambiguity, for, for complexity, rather than only signal and noise, truth and falsehood. Moreover, we need to avoid the fragmentation of Western science in its many disciplines. And that is where the transdisciplinarity is a really important aspect. And we need to focus on change and relations rather than stability and entities. Part of the way in the Western culture that can help us here is the complex adaptive systems approach, which is non-linear and which has not so much of an illusion that we know what the world is like. It actually it focuses on the unknown rather than on the known. And so there is more space for risks and uncertainties. There's change is the rule rather than stability. And that means that we can begin to define reality as a complex of dynamic processes involving disintegration and integration from times past into the future. And unfortunately, the West has never done that. Ever since the foundation of the Royal Society in the 1660s, to have a career in science, you had to prove things because you can't prove anything for the future. You had no consideration of the future. You only had a consideration about the relationship of past and present. That is another aspect that needs to be done. Now, my experience at RIN, I spent more than a year there, and also sort of talking to you and again hearing this wonderful symposium, I think Japan is very special in this respect. It has not acculturated Western ideas very much to the core of its society. It has maintained a long-term perspective of culture that is embedded in nature. And so does has not really fallen for the West's simplification of nature. Nature is a partner. Community in symbiosis between nature and humanity. Small-scale agroecology dominates. Culture is in interaction with nature is the theme that we touched upon so many times in this symposium. So one of, I want to simply come out with a few things that particularly struck me in the symposium. One of them is gardens as imaginaries and as narratives. Another one, which I had from before, is that in Japanese culture, the only permanent thing is change. And I had the incredible pleasure to be at the transition between one of the, the last and the present Issei sanctuaries in 2013. And that has made that clear to me. 
The West has chosen Aristotle and a focus on stability over his contemporary Heraclitus of Ephesus, who actually argues that everything is change and that change is the only permanent thing. That focus on Aristotle made it possible to objectify phenomena. If they change permanently, it's very difficult to make them into objects. In Japan, you focus on the interactive learning and doing. And this is something where I'm not sure I've understand both of you, Julien and Moreau, but this concept of wasa, learning, doing, you better help me figure that out better. But an important aspect that I saw in Tohoku in 2013 with Abe-san is that the community is more important than the individuals. And that isn't only among humans. That is also the community of people, plants, animals, and everything else. And Christoph Ruprecht has actually very interesting uh, things about that. And then communities are multidimensional and things are negotiable. And therefore, the trajectory of communities is flexible. And I really liked uh, uh, Moreau's talk about judo, for example, in that respect. And a final thing that to me is really important is there is less of a goal orientation. The idea of progress, which dominates the West so much, to my mind, is actually a totally false uh, track. And then I come to my last slide. And that is basically, I would argue that in the whole of the sustainability problem, problematic, because the world will have to free itself from Western values, Japan can actually have a really interesting role. And I've seen in this symposium how important that role can actually be. So I would encourage all of you to go out and to spread that particular perspective and to contrast it in a very strong way with the current Western perspective. Part of the reasons for that, that Japan can play this role is because it has, in my sense, only partly adapted to the capitalist industrial world that was imposed on it over the last century and 150 years. Underneath, it has kept its own traditional values about nature. And therefore, I think it could mediate between East and West based on a complex systems perspective. So my question is, can Japan, with this unique situation, forge a path forward for our sustainability problems? And that, to me, is what I would love to see in the future of RIN. And this symposium encourages me a lot to actually begin to see that. So I like the idea that this is a new beginning rather than an end. So the diverse special ways of experience, nature, and social environmental sustainability, as shown in this symposium, are core to what I think needs to be done. So let's leave it at that. Thank you very much. I have no idea how much time I've spent, but probably way too much. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. So uh, today, uh, the world is uh, facing a dead end uh, with respect to environmental issues as well. Uh, I feel that we are in a dead uh, end, and uh, maybe uh, it origin originates uh, from the Euro-American uh, thoughts. And uh, uh, also, you talked about the uh, colonization of uh, nature and uh, mind. And also in that, uh, Japan or Japanese, what are the roles that we can play? Uh, these were uh, depicted. And of course, as Rin, we need to do something about this uh, dead end. In that, there is one thing that I would like to convey to all of you, that is, Japan, of course, has to play the role, but uh, we want to uh, work together. Uh, we have the uniqueness uh, of Japan and Japanese, as has been uh, highlighted by uh, Sanders, and uh, also Sanders included and other people, Augustin, 
Ilan and Frederick. I have uh, cited some of the names that I uh, remember now, but uh, I, with these people and many more, we would like to uh, together uh, consider how uh, Japan can play uh, our role. So, as a, a characteristic of our way of a dialogue uh, of Japanese, uh, well, there is a word, uh, a dialogue in English, but the Japanese uh, way of uh, thinking or uh, talking, a uh, dialogue is like a debate. But uh, in case of uh, Japanese people, we want to talk together, converse together in order to create something together. Synlog. Shall I say synlog? Okay. So uh, not a dialogue, but uh, synlog uh, is the word uh, I would like to use. So it is a synlog uh, that uh, uh, is a part of the Japanese way of speaking. So, so much from the moderator and uh, Yamagiwa-san. Uh, listening to uh, Sander, I think uh, what you are always saying and what Sander has uh, mentioned. Uh, now uh, is uh, very much in common. Yes, what Sander just said, uh, he reflected upon the uh, history of uh, human beings, uh, chronologically speaking, and I uh, do research prior to that history that he spoke of right now. So it's uh, uh, the society uh, prior to human history, or maybe modern uh, humans. That's my uh, area of research. And so, as Sander said, human or society uh, should be uh, reconsidered uh, prior to history, prehistory, and uh, we need to validate uh, where we made our mistakes. So, uh, from that perspective, uh, well, I am a primatologist, and Frederick is uh, used to be a primatologist. So, and uh, the symposium's uh, topic was uh, a garden, which uh, includes humans and non-humans, including plants and stones and other nature. Um, garden is a place for that, and the fact that we uh, chose this subject was very interesting. Uh, with regard to Waza, uh, that uh, he questioned, Sander questioned, uh, Moreau and Frederick uh, talks about uh, Waza, and I'd like to uh, share with you an episode. Uh, Moreau said that uh, uh, this is uh, something that is not taught by the teacher or the master. Uh, as a primatologist, uh, Franz Duval, who studies the chimpanzees, he says, uh, he taught, he has a written a uh, book entitled Ape and Sis Master, a sushi master. And he went to uh, a sushi a shop and he saw the uh, sushi cook uh, making sushi. And uh, uh, he asked, uh, how do you teach how to make sushi? And the response was that uh, the master never teaches how to uh, make sushi. Um, the disciple uh, has to just uh, watch uh, for about two years. Uh, and the master does not teach his disciple, uh, but the disciple keeps on, the student keeps on just observing uh, that. And by just observing, the, the student learns uh, how to make sushi uh, uh, in two years. And after two years, when the master uh, tells uh, the student uh, to uh, make sushi, the student can naturally uh, make uh, sushi. And so uh, that was uh, what he learned at a sushi shop. And so uh, he says observational motivational learning. Uh, he called it observational motivational uh, learning. I think this is a characteristic of human beings as well. Uh, we use the word starumane, monkey uh, mimicking. Uh, but actually, uh, monkeys cannot uh, copy. It's only the human beings that can copy or mimic. Uh, to mimic something physically, uh, this cannot be done by gorillas or chimpanzees or monkeys. It's only uh, the human beings that can do this. So uh, prior to language, uh, not only animals, uh, human beings can become stones, can become the flowing river. So we have this uh, physical ability 
and we uh, acquired that somewhere in the history of human beings. So human beings uh, can adapt to a various uh, environment. This is a very important characteristic of human beings. A fudo or is a rhythm, uh, uh, Yoan said. And uh, in Japan, Yamazaki Masakazu uh, is a, a theater writer, and uh, he uh, passed away uh, one year and a half year ago. And uh, social ho homobia bees is what he uh, wrote about in 2003. And he says that uh, culture is rhythm. So, uh, so culture can be appreciated as a, a physical rhythm, something that is created by a physical a rhythm. That can be one uh, appreciation or understanding. And this can be expanded to plants as well. I have done an experiment in the past. Uh, I used to work for a monkey center, and chimpanzee a child and orangutan child uh, was to play, but they could not play. Chimpanzee wants to chase. Orangutan uh, wants to uh, cling to something. They're, they have different rhythms, so uh, their physical rhythm cannot be uh, uh, assimilated, but uh, human beings uh, have flexibility, so we can play in different uh, rhythms. This is a part of the human being culture, so human beings have uh, flexibility in this way, and that is the reason why we have uh, uh, generated various uh, cultures. We have made uh, various uh, variations. Uh, uh, wolves are only wolves. Uh, gorillas are gorillas at anywhere, but uh, human beings uh, can change, physically speaking, from its physical aspect. So uh, physical cultures are different in different parts of the world. This uh, needs to be once again restored. And Sanders said, language, he talked about language. Language is very important. Language expresses culture and uh, language expresses rhythm because culture is rhythm. So when we consider that uh, culture is uh, physical and uh, so we have to be conscious of that and we have to go along. We have to find a way to go along with the nature in that uh, perspective. Thank you. Yamagiwa-san, thank you very much. So uh, culture is rhythm, and there is the physical aspect to that. So I have a question. You said that human beings are flexible, and uh, human beings uh, in different food can create various uh, culture, and there are various cultures all over the world, and they all have different rhythms, and Sander uh, uh, and Europe may ha uh, and Europeans and Japanese may have different uh, rhythm but how can we play together how can we dance together although uh, we have different uh, rhythms I think that's a uh, very important do you have any hint maybe uh, it's waza uh, humans can play with any animals uh, because humans have that uh, capability so cultures can be linked with each other I am very optimistic with regard to this but animals gorillas uh, cannot never become human beings uh, if we uh, tell them to mimic uh, human beings uh, they cannot mimic human beings but human beings can mimic uh, gorillas and this is the capability that uh, we uh, gained before language so uh, waza Let's take up the topic of Waza. Frederick and Yuan uh, yes. talked about Waza. It's not just skill. So there is this uh, sensitivity to that. Um, Hasegawa san, uh, in the field of art, um, how is uh, Waza expressed in art? So let me ask Hasegawa-san to respond first, and then uh, Sako-san uh, from uh, Kyoto uh, Seika University, please respond to this question. Hasegawa-san first, please. So for your question from Dr. Abe, it's how I see whether it's an house or the kume, 
Is that your question? How I see the Waza, right? So, as the Professor Yamagiwa talked about, and he said monkeys cannot mimic human beings. And uh, yesterday, I showed a Fukuchan. Well, actually, the Fukuchan who worked at the bar, a monkey who worked at the bar, actually, uh, he or she behaved like a human girl. And uh, looking at the Fukuchan, the monkey um, girl from the back, she looks really like a human. But anyway, so when it comes to Waza, so when I look at the music and dance, it's contained uh, bodily rhythm, physical rhythm, and especially with music. Um, as an curator, uh, we, uh, we envy music. So music is uh, spread around the world so easily. And also dance, hip hop, and Japanese dance is not, maybe not, but maybe classic ballet, ballet or hip hop dance that can spread all around the world um, very quickly. So they're related to rhythm. However, the visual art is more difficult to spread because it's reflect a local culture, local language, or local memory. Because of that, it's more like an information, it's more like a, a discursive, it's more like a related to the local memory, which um, that is a visual, what the visual arts are. So it's very difficult to communicate to the world through the visual uh, visual arts. For example, if you want to communicate Japanese art to the people in Africa or Latin, Ameri Latin America, I face a lot of difficulty communicate uh, the, through the visual arts. And when it comes to Wada, there are two types of Wada, I think. So one that can go across the global boundary, and another one is more, more like a local. So local waza, that is uh, refurbished and refined. So this is another way. And once you achieve the high level of waza, then it could be uh, shareable with others. So I believe there are two types of waza. One is, uh, is there to communicate widely. Another one is, is there for the transformation. And also, another one is a much more local waza. It's very difficult to share, for example. Uh, but if you uh, really master, that could be something shareable. So there are two types of waza, I think. So I don't think we can generalize waza into one meaning. Thank you very much, Sako-san. And Sako-san sometimes work with Safletlik. And so Hasegawa-san classified Waza into three types. But then in your university, how do you see Waza? Or in your uh, joint activity with Fredlik, how do you see Waza? <laughs> um, that's a really challenging question once again, yeah? But I'll try. The Waza that Afrelik published, the, I, actually, I am actually, con, I, con, I, I am one of the contributors to the Waza published by Afrelik. And what I wrote about is like a, a traditional technique or know-how, how to uh, pass on those, uh, those, uh, those. Several years ago, the French student came to our college and then um, he, con he conducted how the traditional uh, waza have been taught in Japan. And uh, he says it's more like uh, uh, artisan type of the uh, learning. So in Europe, uh, you try to teach. So explain and uh, explain how to do it. But in Japan, it's a little bit different. It's like a sushi uh, the learning. So in especially art, on art school, um, usually teachers uh, don't, don't really teach, I mean, how to create artworks. And uh, of course, uh, basically, 
practicing is very important in Japan, and then through practicing, uh, there are sometimes uh, great works, but sometimes it's, uh, there's a question whether that is an art or an early, art, art artifact. So how much creativity in there? That is a question. And uh, thinking about your discussion of today, maybe civilization in the process of development of civilization in Europe, maybe uh, they shifted from artifact to creativity in much earlier stage. So they uh, theorize uh, in a logical way in an earlier phase in history in uh, Europe or Western society. But still, Japan is much more like our art, art thinking. It's more like uh, mm -hmm. uh, local or maybe uh, Japanese people try to learn by their bodies. And just sharing my experience, uh, something that I faced difficulty when I came to Japan is about uh, learning Japanese. It's Japanese cannot be explained logically, but uh, through your body, uh, you are able to uh, learn Japanese. That is how I learned Japanese. So maybe I learned Japanese through the manzai, Japanese and comedian talks. Well, um, in the beginning, I didn't understand anything, but um, I, I tried to understand that. So maybe uh, thinking about uh, relation between um, nature and human, human beings, uh, maybe empathy is very important. But uh, Europe is a little bit different. Europe, uh, in Europe, people try to um, give a logical account. And uh, the MoMA, at MoMA, uh, there was an exhibition for arch an architecture without architects and a vernacular and architecture were presented. So in Africa, well, non-architects, uh, non well, those who are not architects actually build great an architecture. And also Japanese actually, uh, Japan, well, Japanese uh, uh, college also made investigations in Africa and uh, Latin America. And they try to understand some kind of uh, rules behind the uh, architectures in Africa or Latin America, but they couldn't find any uh, rules behind them. So, you know, uh, well, European culture is to try to figure out some kind of uh, rules uh, behind anything or behind everything. So they try to uh, find something that is uh, universal. But rather, maybe uh, what we can do is to uh, take uh, things as they are without trying to give any logical account. And also, as for the Professor Sander, uh, shared with us a story of the uh, Western <clears throat> centrism. But before that, um, the, the, the Arab and Arabian world was so uh, dominant. So if you, you compare the, the uh, Arabic world and the Western world, I mean, that could be a quite important a, a perspective. So some Mongol and China and also Middle East, uh, there are um, many different civilizations before Europe, and maybe Japan could be a part of that. But uh, in order for Japan to save the world, I think Japan is maybe uh, this is not this could sound like a criticism about Japan. Japan doesn't have policies. That's why Japan is flexible. Japan actually embrace anything because Japan doesn't have clear policy. Uh, it's a basically a non-religious religion. So Japanese people say, um, I'm atheist, I don't have any religion. That is actually religion of Japanese people. So Japan is open to anything that openness is very important. So just uh, embrace nature as it is. And also, as Ogawa-san said, um, Ogawa-san uh, speaking with an ancestor through the uh, garden, 
And um, actually, Ogawa-san is one of my friends. And over the last 20 years, uh, I actually uh, I speak with um, ancestors. Um, uh, well, uh, actually, I have a longer friendship with Ogawa-san for many years. And uh, Ogawa-san, I think and try to choose an ancestor he want to speak with. And also, when, when you uh, try to control something, there will be also conflict. Therefore, if you embrace, if you are flexible, and if you maybe ambiguity of Jam Japan could save the world in the future. So I think that is a characteristic of the culture of Japan that is an ambiguous culture. Can I add something, uh, what uh, Sako-san said? Uh, the people who inherit Waza in Japan, uh, they don't uh, uh, tell their names. In uh, No or Kabuki, it's the name of the family, also in Sumo. Uh, so we talk of the uh, surname, the uh, family name, and not the, the individual's name. Uh, so the individual does not come out. I think uh, that is the way to inherit uh, Waza in Japan. Uh, so from Sako-san's point of view, it may be that we're escaping from responsibility, but so uh, what is uh, inherited uh, from the ancestors uh, is not just being uh, repeated. We have to exceed what has been inherited uh, from our ancestors. But what we do today is uh, based upon what has been inherited from the ancestors. So we speak that of the tradition of the family. So we do not speak of myself as an individual. I think that is the concept uh, in Japan in inheriting waza. Kyogen Nomura Mansai, I have worked with him and uh, uh, Mansai has uh, been on the stage uh, since the age of three and he says that uh, the data of his father uh, was encoded uh, to, into him. Uh, he, he felt that he was like a machine being encoded by his uh, father. And uh, for a three-year-old uh, child, it was uh, quite excessive. And there is no book. There is no written book. We just just watch the father and uh, the student just writes uh, the note, uh, keeps the recording uh, record uh, on the notebook. So, uh, at what, from what uh, Yamagiwa-san said right now, I thought that uh, Mansai-san's body, Mansai's body, is different from the body of his father, but uh, the program develops and processed in the new body, and because of the different body, something new is born, new uh, evolution is born. So uh, there are new uh, pieces of work, a new piece of uh, Kyogen, and this is something that is generated from Mansai's uh, body, and, and also it inherits the performance of the uh, past, but uh, from what he has inherited, a new piece of uh, Kyogen is uh, born and generated. So gradually there are new things uh, being born. So from that perspective, the logic of the Western society, and it's not the logic that is uh, inherited like in the Euro-American society, but in case of Japan, it is an inheritance of what is uh, processed into the body and uh, made, evolved into something new. So. Uh, Sako is uh, most Japanese than other Japanese, and uh, Sako knows about uh, Japan most, or Japanese people. And Sanders, what do you think? Um, uh, one, we, we have this uh, Orient and the Western, but uh, there is the Arabian world in between. And uh, the Arabian world has its own uh, value. So that, I think that was a, a question from Sako uh, with respect to what do you think about the Arabian world? 
And uh, based upon that question, and uh, what what is your comment uh, uh, from what the three people had uh, to say? So, Sander, please. Okay, thank you. I, I have several comments. Uh, the first one goes on rhythms. And I think it is the fact that humans have multiple rhythms that allows them to relate and to change and to be open-minded and to be part of different cultures, to relate to different animals and plants. So I think it's important to realize that one of the really important aspects that I experienced here in Japan is the primacy of communities over individuals. And I relate that to the fact that in a community, there are always very many different rhythms. And I think it's that multiplicity of rhythms that makes a lot of this kind of thinking possible. When about the Arabs? I, although I have lived in the Middle East, I have never really made a study of the Arabic thinking, mainly because I do not master the written language enough to actually do anything like that. I have started in the 14th century because of the shock that the plague epidemic created both in the Arabic world and in the Western world. And so that change from a cyclical perspective on nature to a linear perspective on nature is for me one of the very, very fundamental events in human history that has enabled the current Euro-American perspective to develop. As to Japan and the world and, you know, why is it impossible for Japan to let people know that they should drop the idea of progress, that they should simply not have so much of a focus on a particular idea? If I read you right, Professor Sacco, it is that the fact that Japan does not have that, which is so essential for Japan, I agree. But I would argue that teaching that to many other societies would actually be a huge step forward. So forgive me for not being able to say much more. I, I really feel incredibly stimulated by all your different but very complicated concepts and ways of thinking that I really don't have enough. I've only spent altogether about a, a year in Japan, but one needs to make a life of living in Japan in order to actually do that. And I didn't get to that in time because the only time when I came, I was already in my 60s and that was too late. Thank you very much, Sandra. I hope that you come to Japan again. Uh, we have many, many hands raised. So, Yoan, who lives in Japan, uh, let's uh, have Yoan say something, please. Hi, thank you. Uh, first, a, a small joke. Perhaps we should move from Satoyama to Sakoyama. <laughs> um, uh, concerning the, the question about Waza, uh, perhaps I, I, I could answer with uh, the same, in the same way Masumi answered was uh, when I first asked him about, uh, about uh, uh, Shizen no Ho, about uh, permaculture. Uh, it was, uh, he always, I, I remarked that he always asked me, uh, re answered me with uh, non th non things. For example, not to cultivate, no 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 tiding. N there is no bad species, and so on. And uh, in, uh, in the Greek, in the ancient Greek, there is a word for that for that kind of reasoning. We name it apophatic reasoning, apophatic logic. 
it's the same for, for, for God in a medieval, medieval area. God is not, but we cannot say what God is, but it, we can say what it is not. And uh, by doing so, we cannot really teach, we cannot teach what is uh, Shizen no Ho, what is the firma culture, but we can say what is wrong. Uh, we can't say what is wrong, but by doing this, you 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 see, we we just uh, Sander just speak about uh, focusing. There is a way of focusing that is that is that consists in focusing without looking at something at the thing we are looking at. So you can we can focus without focusing. This is a very this is really pre uh, this is present in martial arts in judo in uh, in uh, and uh, in uh, in uh, in all martial arts. What, what is f uh, focusing without focusing? Uh, Levi Strauss, uh, I don't know the Japanese word he take it from, but he he translates it by regard éloigné, the view afar, the, the view from afar. The view from afar, and uh, it's the same in archery. What well, a property of that kind of focusing without focusing is that uh, we we don't forget the surroundings, and by the way, the surroundings, <laughs> the milieu, is the what matter. Yeah. For was that? For uh, that, that's uh, something I, I I talk about in in, in that paper. For Waza, it's not, uh, and a, a, a great Japanese po, po, uh, ceramist says, I'm not doing it. The Fudo is doing it with me. The fire is doing it with me. My tools are doing it with me. I, we are all together making that ceramic. It's the, it's the Fudo that is engaged in the making uh, with Waza. That, so the, the, it takes not only time to transform the maker, it also take, uh, takes time to transform the milieu where the maker is performing. So the, the, I think that uh, Waza is, a, is not a technique in the, in, the, in, the, in the modern sense of thinking. It's not something that belongs to the maker. It is something that, that uh, can, uh, it is inter. It is relational. It is. It, it, it is like fire. It, the fire needs woods and need something to start the wood, and uh, it needs it needs air. And this, this, these are those are the conditions for for fire for fire. And there is also condition conditions for water emerging, and those conditions are the existence of a milieu. The existence of a milieu. Or, or, or some, so, someone who gets the waza is living in a milieu. The, 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 you look at the at the atelier, uh, I don't, the, the the place where the ceramist is uh, is working. You you understand something. He is it's a milieu of ceramists, and in that place, waza can happen also. It's uh, when you look at the at the tools of the carpenter of that carpenter I was talking about. You understand that something can, can happen in his hands with those tools. They are also beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I think Fredrik explained the waza, taking the example of Washi. So, that is very similar. And Honda-san's hand is raised, and then Iran, Iran's hand is also raised. And then uh, we can come back to the uh, three speakers later. But um, first of all, I'd like to ask Honda-san. Uh, I have a question for uh, Sander, and maybe somebody else can open up the conversation as well. I was wondering, um, given the topic you presented is decolonizing nature and decolonizing knowledge, where does the place of uh, the global south comes in in this conversation? Because you talked about the dynamic between the east and west, and uh, of course the planet Earth of course also uh, uh, goes beyond much, uh, beyond this uh, framework. And Thank this you. perhaps also, 
yeah, this perhaps also relates to the uh, 13th symposium Daniel organized the unspotting in Asia. Uh, your vision was sort of very big. Uh, it, it included Global South into our conversation in Japan. Thanks. Okay. A couple of, of very simple remarks uh, that explain why I focus on East Asia. On the one hand, I don't know enough about what is happening in the South. On the other hand, this was a symposium about Japan and the West. And so I did focus on that, and forgive me if that was not enough. But if I go further than that, I would argue that all the different cultures in the South essentially have to do the same thing. They also need to decolonize their concepts, their thinking, their way of looking at nature. But this was already a hugely difficult task for me to do this for this symposium only between the West and the East. And I have, just like I don't have the enough knowledge about the Arabic world, I don't have enough knowledge about the African world to actually do that, or of the Indian or, or Southeast Asian world. So it's a practical question. It's not a fundamental question. I did argue at some point in the <coughs> paper and in the presentation that every culture has to do its own thing. And that what we need to break down is this universalism that the Euro-American culture has imposed on so many other cultures. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Sander, for absolutely fascinating uh, set of talks, not only today, but earlier, wherever I was able to participate. It's really, I've learned a lot, as Sander said also, um, but also from Sander's comments, I wanted to follow up a little bit because the idea of the decolonization of the mind I think is a very important one in this, but a very difficult one. And in the sense that the perspective of Japan and of Rin in particular, the opportunity for Rin and Japan to lead in finding a new direction, a new decolonization that can be adopted or can be adapted perhaps more precisely by other regions, other cultures, it seems to me that that is part of what, in a, at least academic sense, what you've done in leading the way with complex adaptive system approaches, um, but which also require, I mean, I'm, I'm not contrasting it, I'm just saying, including yeah. the, the notion of the particular culture and context being critical in how that is actually applied or implemented, that it isn't a universal system no. that can be just sort of dropped in place in every academic institution or any research environment, but that the concepts, and I, I don't understand Vasa, but what I gather of pieces is a much more holistic sense mm -hmm. of how things um, are integrated and how one, in a sense, plays a role first as really an observer, a critical observer, perhaps. And it seems to me that's not in contrast to this idea of complex adaptive systems oh. thinking. And, in, and perhaps that's something that could be further um, explored, developed, and used. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree, and I'm glad you add this. I think there's two things to it. On the one hand, I want to emphasize something that I learned secondhand, that one of the main protagonists of complex adaptive systems, Brian Arthur, is actually very close to a number of Taoist people in China yeah. and Japan. 
and he has used the complex systems as a bridge between East and West. And I think that's possible. What makes that possible, particularly that complex systems don't look at the past and try and explain the relationship between past and present, mm -hmm. but actually look at the emergence of new ideas at any point in time. So it is not, and there again, I, I really grateful for Professor Sacco's uh, comment. It is not trying to force the world into a particular system. It does the reverse. It basically says we have forced the, in the West, we have forced our vision of the world into a particular system. And that actually is not particularly helpful. So we need to change that. We need to open up to all these different cultures. And there is a lot of very interesting literature about that. One thing that sort of really sort of put me into all of this is the work by Taleb about the black swan, where he basically argues that in the West, we have by reducing everything to the simplest thing possible following Occam in the, 13th or in the 11th century, we have created an illusion of control over the world. And we need to break that illusion down. And we need to make sure that we acknowledge that actually we know very little, rather than use science to say that we know a lot. So that maybe is enough for as a comment to what you're saying, but I very much sympathize. And I think this can be done, and it is happening, actually. But very, very small. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sanders, and also uh, Ilan -san. Sanders and Ilan -san, thank you very much. And we, we have uh, non Japanese members at the ring, Daniel Niles. And Daniel has a question, I believe. For a long time, shall we? Pardon? Frederick was waiting. I thought we were going to Frederick. Yes, I shall go. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, um, I want to come back uh, a minute for to this idea of Waza, uh, and I think Frederick maybe does as well, um, because it, it opened up, I think, in very interesting ways. Uh, Sako Sensei mentioned the idea of uh, the architecture without architects, and that raised in my mind, the idea uh, of art without artists. Um, and that come a bit close to some of our discussions in these past days. It seemed to me that Waza is not really about any particular craft, but it's really about, it's a kind of method of knowledge transmission. There's no specific teaching. As Hasegawa-san said, there's no book, there's no fixed body and the, the knowledge just can't be poured into the to the brain uh, and and then and then and controlled and manipulated instead i think in as i understand at least this idea of waza is that you must go into the thing you must understand the thing on its own terms you must go into it which at the same time is letting the thing come into you and this is why uh, the body techniques are such an important part uh, of the idea of, of Waza. So it's not really about craft. It's uh, more about um, ways, ways of understanding things. Uh, and, and the things that you are understanding have much to do with the way that you live in a particular place. This come uh, back to Ilan's idea of the waza and the, and the milieu. And it occurred to me that this idea of going into the things, of going to understand them on their own terms, also enters into our discussion of, uh, of, of, of animism, of the internal energies of things, um, of the internal presences of things. Sander says we must decolonize our minds of the idea of the rational, uh, ordered mechanical nature. We have been talking about here the inside relationships, the animisms, the energies, the patterns. People have been talking about the voices, 
traveling through time and space, uh, the presences of the world. And Yamagiwa Sensei and uh, Monica Gagliano had very interesting exchange about these, um, these tapping into these alternative ways of knowing across species. And so I wanted to come back to this question of animism as a kind of inspiration for this uh, approach to um, turning away from the, the rational, uh, logical uh, mind. So I wondered, I wanted to turn back to our, our panelists here. I wonder if you would care to comment on this. So, as the moderator, yes. Well, uh, I'm leaving the three people. Uh, so, Sako san, Hasegawa san, and Yamagiwa san, in this order, can you comment on uh, animism? Well, uh, this time we talked about garden. Abe san also mentioned dialogue. And uh, he said that it is sin log for Japanese people. When I look at the um, Western culture, it's a dichotomy, uh, inner and the outer, visual, uh, visible, invisible. Um, there is a clarity to, to make it explicit. That is the Western um, process. In Mali, uh, when I look at various uh, uh, tribes, uh, the uh, concept of animism is not clarified in Mali. The link between the inner and the outer, uh, there are uh, limitless uh, space in between. And uh, between visible and invisible, there are many, many uh, limitless number of space. So it's not linked directly. So when we think of the society going forward, uh, it's not that everything is connected. Uh, there is something in between. We talked about aida or in between. Uh, we have to think of this uh, in between. Uh, I think this is necessary for all culture and uh, how we can interpret aida or in between, I think is what we need to consider. And then I think this can be related to belief and so forth. And uh, by that, I think we can look at the nature in a different way. Thank you. Hasegawa-san, uh, we talked about a medium yesterday and uh, also to link the outer and the inner. I think that's very important to connect the outer and the inner. As a curator, what did you think of what Sako-san said? In terms of animism, Uh, the overseas uh, animism, there are many who do studies on animism, and uh, they say that uh, we say that uh, we need to update animism. What do we mean by updating animism? Uh, this cannot be uh, explained uh, simply in this uh, venue, but uh, in this occasion. But what we're thinking is that, as Sako san said, this uh, physical or spiritual or uh, in between animism and do uh, animism does uh, exist, but right now there's technology and network, and there are different layers or levels, uh, which makes it very complex. And also listening to what you are saying, I think that uh, uh, people uh, has a very a romantic uh, image with regard to waza of Japan, but uh, actually uh, as a reality there. Are less people uh, who have waza and there are some waza that are becoming instinct and to inherit and to renew waza is uh, something that uh, requires a enormous amount of effort so i think uh, we shouldn't be too romantic about the waza we need to analyze uh, we need to also incorporate the western idea as well uh, this is something that i was expecting in this kind of discussion so I'm very happy that very people feel affirmative or positive about the Japanese concept, but there are people who are uh, extincting, and I am amidst uh, these uh, people. And in Kanazawa too, uh, there are uh, 
traditional lacquer uh, craftsmen uh, that are becoming fewer and fewer. And uh, also, there's only one person who can do the golden um, labeling. So this is the reality. And uh, I think uh, we would like for you to understand what kind of position we are in as a curator in terms of reality or the real, realistic uh, difficulty. And with regard to uh, animism, uh, there are industrial robots in Japan. Uh, we, we, I, I heard that it's only the Japanese who uh, name the robots, the industrial robots. And so uh, not only the nature, uh, everything around us, including the systems, we try to interact with these systems and we try to kind of uh, go into those uh, things and uh, we kind of inter internalize these things and we do not separate uh, oneself and the other. So this, it's not interaction, but it's intro action. So by uh, Kalen Balad said so, but Kalen Balad said, uh, based upon BOA, uh, says that it is intra-action uh, between Japanese uh, people. So it's not interaction. Therefore, uh, I think we can consider this uh, concept of animism in an updated version uh, of the modern uh, age. Uh, so not in Satoyama or in, uh, we, we, mo most of the Japanese people do not live in Satoyama. We live in the cities uh, looking at the iPhone. So that's the reality of the, the modern Japanese. And uh, I think the updating of animism has, should be considered in a realistic uh, manner, as I have just explained. So, so in intra-action or intro-action, uh, that is to internalize everything. And uh, that uh, uh, also applies for internet and that applies for how the wild uh, plants grow. And uh, so something that is uh, unseen, including radiation and also fake news uh, surrounding us, uh, these need to be considered as problems in a psychological manner as well. And also, uh, with regard to the memory of the past, Leverand uh, says a thing which waits. Uh, he says that it is something like a ghost. So organic uh, thing is considered and uh, what is in the past can be used uh, in the present with a uh, uh, completely different way. And that's the way of uh, up way of updating animism. So I'd like to stop here. Well, uh, thank you very much. I know that everyone, uh, many people have to, has many things to say, but uh, waza is of course uh, important, but we need to renew our waza and that's very important as well. Yamagiwa-san, would you like to make a comment? What Hasegawa-san said, uh, she talked about uh, we give names to uh, industrial robots. Uh, in the 1950s, a uh, primatologist in Japan uh, gave names to all of the uh, Japanese monkeys uh, to do a study on the, uh, the society of uh, Japanese monkeys. Uh, but uh, the Western people criticized us uh, to study uh, animals by giving uh, names to animals is uh, impossible or uh, it is. Uh, however, uh, after 20, 30 years, uh, the Western researchers have started to give names to the uh, animals in studying uh, their animals. So in order to understand the society of animals, uh, we need to uh, not, uh, we need to understand them with an anal analogy of the Jap the human society and the animal society. So the behavior of the animal society we need to plunge into the animal society and we need to assimilate ourselves in order to study. Uh, and uh, Kawaii Masao uh, said that this is the way of uh, empathy. And apart from that, uh, with regard to the word uh, renewal, Abe-san said the renewal, the necessity of renewal. And uh, Sander also talked about uh, information decolonization. That is the uh, ultimate thing that is uh, approaching us. And uh, this happened in 1980s. 
what I remember now as one phenomena is a something new syndrome, something new syndrome. Uh, this is the opposite of waza. And in uh, each uh, nation, uh, what is new is new. Uh, in the past, uh, in the world of waza, people knew about waza and uh, the new generation, there are many things the new generation do not know. What is new for the new generation was not new for the older generation, but uh, uh, people started to say uh, that uh, a, a new thing should be new to all generation, and uh, that is uh, something new uh, syndrome. And I think uh, this uh, syndrome uh, was spread all over the world, and so there were no more uh, gaps between the generations, and there were no nothing to teach from the older generation to the new generation, and with the internet, uh, knowledge is no longer something that is inherited from the older generation to the new generation, that is with regard to brain knowledge and uh, physical knowledge. Uh, so as Hasegawa-san said, uh, in the world of Waza, uh, it's just remaining there and uh, also remaining as uh, image. And I hate the word scrap and build. This is something that is occurring in the cities. Uh, the, uh, because the cities are surrounded by industrial um, things. And uh, so in order to create something new, you have to destroy something uh, that is old in order to replace it with something new. However, in nature, although nature is stable, but there's always a renewal. That is what is happening in nature. So when I walked, uh, in the jungle, some every day something changed in nature, but nature actually didn't change. Nature is stable, but there's always a renewal in the process of nature. And also, Augustine said, and Monolson said, well, the basically Augustine said that the, the rocks, rocks are asking him to do something on that rock. So it's about a co creation between human and humans and rocks, for example. Maybe garden is a one medium where human beings can co-create with non-humans. And if you look at the Japanese gardens, uh, I think that it's uh, co-creation between humans and nature. And what is happening there is that they repeat the renewal, renewal but still they keep a certain shape. And how this are the same? For example, if you go to it's a shrine that the roof the roof is renewed every twenty years. So this is a renewal, but still the, the shape, the forms are the same. And Kiyomizu Temple is the same. So Kyoto uh, with history of one thousand two hundred years still keep those and wooden structures. But of course, uh, they are, have been renewed many, many times, but still the shape, form are the same if you compare them with uh, once in 1,200 years ago. So the gardens could be at a medium where humans can co-create with nature. So that's why Batsuji say that uh, the moment the um it's an essence of food to my understanding so garden as a theme to aim at renewal i think we can learn from the gardens for our renewal thank you very much and i think time has come but um I still see some hands raised. Yes, yes, yes. Maybe, maybe just one minute, Hanamura-san, and then Fredrik. Just one minute, please. Okay, one minute, okay. In your discussion, something missing in the discussion. Uh, the uh, Berg raised a question about what the subject is. It's about what, who you are. I think this is the biggest question for each of us. In the process of evolution, um, people started to have the, uh, the, uh, our own awareness. So by having an awareness of being 
ourselves. Uh, that's actually the reason why you have a dualism. So me and not not me, but actually the uh, me myself. Uh, we, uh, for example, my body, uh, there are actually 40, uh, 4 billion cells that make up my body. Um, but even me, myself, maybe I, myself, is an you know, imaginary uh, to see as myself, but this is a kind, kind of the imaginary. But actually, our bodies are being renewed every time. Our cells are always renewed. So if you think about the existence of yourself, so you yourself is is, used, uh, is always unrenewed. So we have to pay attention that we are all being renewed. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was just about minutes. Frederick, thank you for waiting. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm very and so pleased to see that the the waza <laughs> played an important role in in uh, the last debate so uh, i invite you to to visit the book <laughs> we we okay. did it on, on the topic waza on the move <laughs> and we but i just want to remind two things uh where we start from it is because of lack because we use some words like know how so we separate uh, knowledge uh, from making in in uh, in French or English language, and we were looking for place where there is no words for transmission and acquisition of knowledge, and place where the vernacular words can be used as heuristic words for a scientific knowledge. And was I was on was one of these words and one of these concepts. And when we launch this, um, this book, uh, we fought with Akira Takada from Kyoto University. We thought we were very limited people to in be interested. And in fact, it was the reverse. A lot of different people um, came to, to employ this world and to exploit it as a, as a tool, uh, as a realistic tool. And what is important, and I would just want to conclude uh, on that point, uh, it, is, it was a way to gather together scientists, non-human, <laughs> uh, humans, uh, artists, uh, designer, and uh, local knowledge, vernacular knowledge in the a, in a same realm. And the WASA allowed us to, to do that. And uh, allowed us to, and, the, and that we made for with this symposium. And if I can make this last comment, we were able for perhaps one of, for the first time to gather all these different type of people, and without hierarchize um, one point of view on the other. So there is no science above and vernacular and artistic. Everybody was, uh, every, everyone was at the same level of cohabitation. So what we were able to do is to make kind of coexistence possible between different realms of, uh, of knowledge. A new kind of fudo, intellectual fudo for everybody. So I wanted to thank everybody for this participation and uh, and playing for a future uh, uh, work together. So okay, thank you, all of you. Uh, so you spoke two and a half minutes, but um, I am kind person. <laughs> Um, I know you have a lot to say, I know, and Hanamura-san also has a lot to say, but uh, I knew it, and then each individual is also stimulated by others' talks, so we wish we had more time to talk, but uh, actually, and over the four or five days, and I think I, I feel I myself is renewed. Just one reflection, well, I should have taken a role as a moderator. As a moderator, I couldn't really share my thought with you. But anyway, uh, I really 
appreciate all the speakers, Sako-san, Hasegawa-san, and uh, Yamagiwa-san, and of course, uh, uh, Sarandar-san, and also Fred Lake is our friend, and Namoro-san, and uh, August Stenberg, Berg-san. Yeah, thank you very much for your contributions. We, I wish to talk more about food, though, but uh, let's continue our discussions. But anyway, uh, we need to leave, but then um, there will be next opportunity, I'm sure. So uh, let's create and discuss our re renewed ideas next time. Okay, thank you very much once again, everyone, for your participation.